Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Crime and Entertainment. I have here a first-time guest, but I've actually been friends with this guy for uh, quite a long while. We message back and forth. We've interviewed uh, a few of the same people. I bounce a lot of ideas off him. Um, he's dropped me a, no a lot of knowledge as well. Please welcome to the show, Mr. Gunner Lindblom. Gunner, how are you, my friend? Good, man. How you doing? Uh, I don't know if I should call you Wade, Hollywood, or Chip. Uh, just Hollywood Wade, man. That's good. That's, right. A lot of people ask me that, but... Kind of the reason behind all that is uh, Chip was a nickname growing up. So when I grew up in this little small town called Darlington, South Carolina, they didn't really have anything but like a NASCAR track there. And it was a nickname. That's all they I needed. Just, I just didn't really like the name Wade. And so everybody called me that. All through high school, it was Chip and all my annuals. I even had Chip on a freaking debit card. And it's not even my real name. The bank there just knew me, so they put it. It was yeah. a credit union. So they put it on a debit card. Well, when I got older and started putting in for like jobs, I was putting in for like other places and they would call and they'd be like, all right, we want records for Chip Williams. And I was like, well, we don't have a chip. Right. Like, oh, well you mean Wade. And so then I started having to go by Wade. So it's like everybody from hometown knows me as Chip. Everybody like now up here where I live out in Charleston knows me as Wade. And then I use Hollywood Wade for the show. Cause back in the day I used to, uh, dub and copy movies all the time when they would come out i would you know, hook up two and you look hollywood let's face it a little <laughs> hollywood look i'm just saying yeah so that, that's how that name got stuck there so uh listen man i'm glad to finally get you on the show because you've got a heck of a story you got a lot going on like right now currently with you and youtube and we're gonna get into all that but i guess first let's just kind of let's start from the beginning tell everybody a little bit about your life coming up and then, you know, we can just lead on into it because you got so many different avenues we can travel. We're probably going to have to do a two-parter. Yeah, for sure. I um, warm up here, by the way. I'm cracking this thing. I don't know if you ever know. If you know what these things are, they're called LaCroix. They're disgusting. My wife loves them, but I think they're gross. But it was the first thing I could grab in the fridge. I'm just like, eh. Yeah. And don't drink them. They're horrible. She likes them. <laughs> it's like a pop without sugar. You know what I'm saying? It's, they're oh, gross. Yeah. This I one is really that. gross. Like but carbonated anyways, water. <laughs> basically. So, so my real name is Alonzo um, Gunner Lindblom. Mm -hmm. And so I think the last name throws a lot of people off when I start talking about Italian stuff, mafia, Sicilians, whatever. But the fact is, I grew up in the, my parents divorced when I was four. I don't even know if I was four. I think I was like three. And, uh, and I moved in with my grandma, Grandpa Toko. Uh, in Gross Point, Michigan, which is kind of a wealthy area uh, outside of Detroit, rich suburb, um, and that's kind of synonymous with Italian Sicilians and the mafia. And um, the boss of the Detroit mafia, in fact, lived a few blocks away, and his last name is Toko. Also, he was my grandpa's cousin. They were they were close. They grew up together, so they basically grew up in the same neighborhood and lived within a couple blocks apart for their whole lives, and whole lives, you know, until they died. So like like sixty, seven years, whatever it was, but um. Anyway, so when I went and lived with them, I, I kind of uh, was in, in this neighborhood where everybody in my neighborhood, well, at least the only people that we really interacted with were Sicilians. Um, a lot of them were mafia tied, you know, mobbed up. And they were all kind of like, like the same general several block radius. They'd come over, we'd go over, they'd have parties, we'd have parties, we'd have events, you know, every funeral, wedding, anniversary party, baptism, on and on, church. Church was a big thing. Every every week you go to church and everybody sees everybody and, you know, hugs and kisses and shakes hands. It was a very old world, very old school Sicilian environment. Like very, just like, you know, you might see in a movie or everybody kisses each other on the cheek. Everybody's, you know, very respectful. Everybody shops at each other's businesses. Everybody supports each other. Everybody knows each other. And everybody's a cousin or an uncle or an aunt or a niece or a nephew. And that's just kind of how it is. And, you know, as a kid, I never really questioned, you know, who was who, um, how I was related to Tony or Frankie or Mikey or Laura or Jenny or Renee or whatever. All my cousins, they were just, you know, my mother would say, I was three, four years old. And they said, there's your cousin Renee. And I'm like, okay, yeah. hi. And then that's it. And then the old men would come around, the old, the old, you know, the kind of, some of them were mob bosses, not all of them, but um, a lot of them were high level mob bosses because they'd grown up in that neighborhood and they, they knew my grandpa. My grandpa was a layoff bookie. I don't know if anybody doesn't know what a layoff bookie is. It's just kind of a... Uh, it's your bookie's a, bookie. <laughs> yeah, it's a bookie's bookie. Exactly. It's a bookie's bookie. And he handled a lot of heavyweight for some of the heavyweights, no pun intended. 
And then, so they were around coming and going all the time. And I didn't pay any attention to them because it was my normal world. It was my normal life. You know, seeing guys pull up in Cadillacs and Lincolns all day, get out, you know, fat guys with a big picky ring and a, you know, gold chain and cigar and sit around talking in Sicilian in the family room while they had four phones going and they all speak in Sicilian was normal. It was literally my normal everyday life, my entire life. Um, and it was just, it was normal. So, so I had a bunch of cousins that were around my age. Um, most of them were normal. A couple of them weren't and they, a couple of them were bad kids like I was. So I kind of, obviously I migrated towards them. I didn't have a father figure because my parents divorced and my closest thing to a father figure was my uncle Pete, Pete Toko, who was kind of a young up and coming wise guy, kind of a, I won't say tough guy. He really wasn't a tough guy, but he was a con man, a scam artist, a drug dealer, a wise guy. And he grew up with he grew up, all his first cousins and cousins and stuff around him were all the sons and daughters of like the high level mob guys, right? So, and he was like the worst one of the bunch. So he was a, a certified bad guy. You know, the other ones, they, a lot of them, they had pruned to be white collar criminals or real business, like legitimate businessmen. Like, he, you know, they, here's Silver Spoon, here's a business, here's a whatever, put you in business, here's contacts, you know, city officials, everybody in my pocket, I'll help you out, you know, and that, that my uncle didn't have that, he, because he was a, he was like me, he was a screw-up, he was dyslexic, so he dropped out of school, and, and he was kind of an outcast, so he took to selling drugs, and, and, and cons, and scams, and rackets, and hustles, hung around a bunch of bikers, well, he was my, the closest thing to my, uh, I guess, the father figure at the time, Although he's only 12 years older than me, uh, he's like uh, kind of like an older brother, right? So he he, he kind of takes me in under his wing, and you know he he would bring me with him to the Easter Market. Like the Easter Market is is a very mobbed up. Uh, it's, it's funny. It, it, it's someone who recently was like, oh, there's only one mob business in the Eastern Market, and that just goes to show you how naive they are. The entire Eastern Market was mobbed up, and it still is. It still is. But I mean, yeah. but back then, from the 1940s up to the 90s or 2000, it was just it, you couldn't even get a a business in the Eastern market, unless you had mob ties because they control the, the people who gave out the licenses and the permits and the blah, 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 blah. So my grandpa had this business in the Eastern market and uh, my uncle Pete would take me down there all the time. And they'd sit around and play dice and sit around and play poker. And I didn't pay much attention to it when I was a kid, but, uh, and then eventually I would evolve into that same guy and I'd be the guy in the next generation was down there and all these warehouses that were, you know, food, food, um, you know, they supplied food to whatever. My grandpa supplied uh, food to the Detroit public schools for 25 years. And um, so there was like a little lounge area in the warehouse and the trucks were coming and going and he'd usually hire black dudes, kind of the, load them up and whatever. And then like, you know, some of like cousins or, or my grandpa's kids, my uncles would manage them and, and they'd sit around a lot of the day and they'd play poker and smoke cigars and bullshit and talk trash. It was just like out of a movie. And I eventually would start doing that myself in my 20s. But at some point, um, you know, I, I got expelled from school when I was 15 years old and definitely expelled. So I got kicked out. I was just a horrible kid, just a bad kid, always fighting, always in trouble for something. I mean, I started catching felonies when I was probably I, I, my first felony was um, destruction of property over 100. My next felony after that was interfering with a police investigation because I refused to testify against somebody that tried to rob me. And somebody had seen them trying to rob me at gunpoint for, for my leather coat. And I pulled out a knife and was like, yo, what's up? And somebody saw it, called the police. They investigated me. And, and they're like, you know, did you recognize him? I said, yeah. And then like, well, who is it? And I wouldn't tell them. So they hit me with a felony for that, you know? And so I was like getting all these cases as a little kid. And then eventually I got expelled for a stolen property um, situation where my friend stole uh a leather jacket out of a locker and I had been already been suspended two or three times for fighting. I was just a bad kid. They all, the whole school thought I was a lunatic. And the main reason for that was I wasn't scared of nobody. You know, when you're, when you're a freshman in high school and you weigh 135 pounds, you're naturally you should back down from the, you know, the, the captain of the football team and the, these tough right. guys, the seniors and stuff. I wouldn't, I like, I'd be like, F you let's fight. And they go, Hey, this, poor, this kid's crazy. He's mentally ill. You know, people are like, Oh, come on, Al, man. You're going to get your, you're going to get killed. I said, F you, man. I said, and they'd be like, what are you going to do? I'm like, swing on me. Find out. I would have probably got my ass beat, but, but I'm not going to let you just punk me, you know, cause like it's some pussy. Right. So I kind of like people, people started to look at me like, man, the kid's not right, man. He's, you know, he's mentally ill or something. He's, he's just not normal. So my friend Ricky, who was a scumbag on every level, was breaking into lockers. He had the scam where he figured out how he could do the comms and break into locks. 
to the lockers and he was stealing stuff. And then, and then one day he comes to me, he has got this leather coat. Now his brother who actually kind of grow up and be a wise guy too. He's dead now, but a guy named Frank, he didn't really like me though, the brother at the time, but, uh, he, he, Ricky comes to me and says, I got this jacket. Um, I got it from my brother. Hey, give me back. Cause I sold weed. I started selling weed when I was about 15. So about this time, and at about this time I, I was selling weed, I was probably about 16. I actually was, I failed eighth grade to be perfectly honest. I, I was held back. The first time I was in eighth grade, I got, I failed it. And they sent me back to do it again. So by the time I was a freshman in high school, I was like 16 or about to be started selling weed to kind of support myself on drugs. Cause you know, get kicked out of school. got nothing to do. I got expelled from eighth grade, by the way, expelled from eighth grade halfway through the year. So all I did was drive around the, the neighborhood on a moped selling, selling weed and cocaine. Like, like, <laughs> I would buy an eight ball of cocaine and break it down into like half grams and yeah. add a federin, crush a federin up on it, and, and then <laughs> and then sell it to all these freaking neighborhood freaking losers, and uh, and that's what I did all day. And then of course I started high school and I just didn't last that long. And um, and then Ricky sells me this jacket and I look at him and I say, man, this jacket is it, it, it's not stolen out of a locker. He says, no, no, I bought it from my my brother Frank gave it to me. It don't fit him no more. So if you'll give me a fifty dollar bag of weed, a quarter ounce, I'll sell it to you. This badass black leather coat. I'm like, yeah, man, this freaking thing's dope. You know, wore it to school like the next day, and um, and sure enough, freaking the, the the kid who who saw it or whose kid who's owned it saw me wearing it, reported it to the uh, school cop. But that's a crazy story, and the reason I'm telling you this is because they expelled me from the school, and then my grandfather, who was like really the only time I ever saw him try to flex his um his pedigree. He, my mother uh, arranged for me to, for them to have a meeting with the superintendent of the school system, right? Cause they expelled me, like we wouldn't want them. And so a meeting, it was a meeting with the school cop, the, the, the vice pre- uh, principal and vice principal, uh, the superintendent, blah, 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 blah. And, and they go in there and my grandpa walked in there like, like a mob Don, like he, he played the role, which he normally wouldn't have done, but he did. And he says, I, maybe he wasn't playing a role. Maybe he was just being himself, but it, it, it would look like, you know, a movie or something. He walks in and he, they're all sitting there and he goes, do you know who I am? And they said, yeah, Mr. Toko, we know who you are. He says, well, good. Cause I want my grandson to stay in high school. I want him to graduate. And they're like, well, sorry, we don't want him. He's a troublemaker. He's a bad kid. We, we don't want him. And he kind of argued with them and they didn't give a shit. They said, we don't want him. He ain't coming back. We don't care who you are. So they basically <laughs> said, and, and they just like, you know, that was that. So now I'm out on the street, like 15, 16 years old. And of course I took dove right into the uh, drug business, selling more weed and Coke and stuff like that. And then I got into selling steroids. And then my uncle Pete found a big bag of weed in my pocket when I was about 16. And I thought I was in a big trouble because drugs were a no, no in our house. You know, drugs were kind of a big, you know, no, no. My, my, my uncle Pete got busted for cocaine. I'm trying to give us some more light here. But my uncle Pete you got said you started telling the steroids. When did you start? Because I've seen some pictures on your Instagram. You were a pretty big dude, man. When did you start like bulking up and putting on a I'll lot of size? You. I'll tell you. Uh, well, that was that was kind of after the fact. I when I was. Um, anyways, my my. I'll tell you that in a second. My grand my uncle found this weed on me, and like because my uncle Pete had been busted for selling cocaine drug. All I ever heard was them yelling at him about drugs. Right. Right. And how bad they were. So when he came to me and said, Alonzo in the basement and he throws a bag of weed in me, we had the same coat. He bought me a leather coat that was like his. And basically it was the same coat. And I had a bunch of money and a big, like an ounce of weed in the pocket. Well, he says, I'm going into the market and he grabs his coat and he goes to leave. And sometime between when he left and came back, he goes in the pocket and sees like, you know, there's like 1200 bucks and an ounce of weed. And it ain't his. He realizes he grabbed the wrong coat. So he comes back and he says, in the basement. And I go in the basement and he throws a bag of weed at me. He goes, what the fuck is this? And I said, well, it's a bag of weed. He's like, what are you doing? I said, I'm making money, making money. He's like, man, come here. He's like, this is garbage weed. This is bullshit weed. If you're going to sell weed, come here. And he takes me up in the garage. We go in the back corners, a bunch of like banana boxes, which is funny. I got a banana box right here. And um, he's got like 10 pounds in there. And he says, here, take a couple of those, you know, a thousand bucks a pound. And so I started selling weed for him. Now, shortly after that, I started working out because some of my boys, my paisans from the neighborhood, they were like, uh, they worked out and they're muscle bound. They're athletes, they're football players. And they got all the girls, the girls liked them. So I was a skinny little wiry in my life. I, I definitely wasn't a big guy, but I'm not back then. And uh, I was a little, I weighed like 140 pounds when I started, started working out. So wow. 
that was it, 140 pounds. And so I started working out, training really hard. And, um, and the, the irony is I started selling steroids because there was money in it and I had plugs. I had a couple plugs for them, but everybody thought I was on steroids when I wasn't. Everybody, everybody just assumed I was taking them because I was selling them. Right. But I wasn't. And I tried them a couple times for a few weeks. They didn't like doing the shots, done a pain in the ass. And like the ones that were actually work kind of puffed my face up. I didn't like it. I didn't need to. I had pretty good genetics. And if I worked out real hard, uh, you know, I, I I grew fast, faster than most of my friends on steroids. So I was like, eh, I don't need steroids. But um, anyway, so and I ended up getting busted selling steroids, um, two hand to hand deliveries of five thousand dollars worth of steroids. Uh, dude set me up, some scumbag, you know, set me up, um, and uh, just I got busted. So they they and what the thing whole the whole thing about the steroid bust was that's remarkable is. I was getting them from a guy named Joe DiMaggio, this Sicilian kind of young, wise guy. He wasn't, to me, he was an older guy at the time because he was 29. And to me, I was like an old guy. He was old to me. The 29 year old dude was like old. Um, he's a big, huge muscle bound dude. All his boys were all muscle bound. I actually ended up getting in with him was a long story, but act, make it short. He knew who my uncle Pete was. And I went up and told him and I said, Hey, I'm Pete Tovel's nephew. And he said, your mom, Grace. I said, yeah. He said, Oh, I know Pete. And so I said, all the juice that I, that, well, some of the juice that you've been selling Jerry has been for me. And Jerry just went away on a baseball scholarship to California. So now I have all these customers and no plug on the juice. So he says, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, here's my number. Call, say, ask to use the tanning bed. Come over to the house and I'll set, hook you up. I go to his house and he'd have this big walk-in safe thing. And he'd have like 10,000 bottles of steroids in there. I didn't know it, but at the time, he's pretty much under investigation by the FBI. Um, they're, they're, they're on his ass. They got his phone wired, everything. And they, they he, there was like, I think there was 55 guys involved. Uh, it's a big organized crime bus, OC bus. And uh, I was just a little nobody you know pauper of a kid who would go over there and he'd say take what you need and like and then pay me when you get the money so i was like oh i, I grabbed you know 12 1500 worth of steroids thinking that's a lot and he'd like laugh and just put it in a little paper bag and send me on my way and i come back later in the week or the next week and go here's your money but he had guys walking out with cases of this stuff you know what i'm saying yeah. i couldn't sell i was just selling to like high school football players and some of the guys you know where he was getting it from he was getting it from all over the world Oh, all over. Okay. They were. They had had it coming in from other countries. They were mailing it. I think there was like I don't know. There's 55 guys involved. I think 13 different states, like not six countries. It was crazy, man. It was a big. It was all over the news. You can look it up, actually. Wow. Yeah. yeah well, um, Bill Bill Crooks looked it up and found it all in there because I told him the year it was, and he's like, oh, I found it. But um, so I didn't. I wasn't. I wasn't involved in that and in that officially in the bus. So that when it happened. I walked into the gym the, the following day and everyone knew I was a little drug dealer that, and they knew I was in with these dagos, Joe DiMaggio and his crew. They knew. So I walk in, they're looking at me. I'm like, you know, and I'm looking I'm like, I set my pull out stereo. Remember the pull out stereo mm -hmm. and I pull out Alpine. I set it on the counter and the chick working at the gym. She's like, what's up? You don't know, do you? I'm like, no, what? She's like, Joe got raided last night. And I'm like, what? She's like, yeah, he got raided last night. Like, oh. So, so, and then I call him and he says, come over, let's talk. And we go for a walk and he says, it's over. I says, is there anything left I can move? He's like, yeah, Tony bomberito has got some cases of Sten. Give him a call, blah, 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 blah. And then about three days later, they, the, these two detectives show up at my house and they say, I'm under arrest for delivery of steroids. And, um, and it was basically, I did two hand to hand sales that they weren't related to the FBI operation. You know what I'm saying? They waited to the waited to bust me until the feds thing swooped down and that was all kind of out of the way. And then they, they, you know, they all cooperated and it was what an FBI agent did come to my house and um, he had the book, we called it the Bible. He had this big book that had all of our names in it. And yeah. whenever you get it, you take whatever you take, you'd write it down in your initials or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he's like, there's another Alan here who's taking 10, $20,000. And, and then there's your Alan. It's like, which one are you? I'm like, definitely the kid. I don't want to definitely the one thing. I remember the FBI agent too, man. He was a big tall guy, and he, he always reminded me of my future parole officer. But uh, anyway, so I, I, I fight this case for for eighteen months, get a lawyer, and um, you know, I had a little bit of money because I was hustling in the streets. But you know, and when I got busted with steroids, the whole game stopped for me, man, <laughs> because 
like a lot of people were scared I was rat. You know, they don't know. You know, I'm out in the street running around. So it was just it changed the whole game for me. It changed the dynamic of my hustle. But so I ended up going to jail for f- five months. And uh, when I get out of jail, that's a whole crazy story in itself because I originally got work release, but I got kicked off work release because uh, uh, two reasons. One, I rigged my my work my schedule so I could bone my girl. I had like a day off to go bone my girl. And the other one was some some black dude trying to I've not tried. He took my cookie off my tray in the county jail and freaking just took it. So I jumped over the table and freaking broke his jaw and freaking started beating his ass. And that was the that was the icing on the cake that sent me into the jail where I had to just do my time. But um, this is where it starts to get interesting, I guess. I mean, I don't know if that's not interesting or not, but no, uh, absolutely, it's interesting. Every story starts from some little thing that always leads up to something. Right, yeah, right. It's those exactly. baby steps that lead exactly. you up to the. I'm trying to get this light out of my eyes a little bit. So, um, I get out of jail. I, to me, in my opinion, this is kind of where it does get it does get a little um, more interesting because I get out of jail. I go to live with my grandparents, my grandma and grandpa Toko in Gross Point again. Uh, excuse me, they're not in Gross Point at the time. I don't want to, the, the, the nerds would say, "Oh, he lied. I caught him in a lie. He got him in a lie." Like, yeah, no. we'll get into that I, later on. Yeah, I referenced that because I, I lived, they lived in Girls Point for 30 some years, but then they moved to St. Clair Shores, which is the next city over. Only only a couple a couple of the lights drive me crazy, man. Um is it any better? I was about to say. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I feel like I'm in a in a in a thing. Uh, so they moved to the next city over and um which is only five miles or six miles from where they had lived all these years but i always just say move back to girls point which it really wasn't at st clair shores which is a neighboring city and when i was there with them i, I had moved in and basically my it was a very pivotal event in my life and i've talked about this event many times not not many but four or five times over the years on shows and and on my own show stuff like that but there was a day I went to my cousin Nina's graduation party and my grandpa was sitting there at a table, um, a couple other mob dudes and um, Tony Giacalone. And a lot of people don't know who Tony Jack. If they don't know who that is, he's he's a kind of a famous, uh, infamous mafioso. He's famous for being the number one suspect in the Jimmy Hoffa murder or, or disappearance. All right. But he was uh, bodies with my grandpa. They grew up together in the same neighborhood and they friends all their life. And so and his his daughter married my cousin my mother's second my mother's first cousin which would make him my second cousin. he was older you know he's like my dad's age or whatever um he was there that day in fact uh, they are all sitting at the same table and he's my grandpa said you know tony you want to see if you can get alonzo some work and he said yeah sure Pete, see what i can do and he and he did so he, he ended up getting me a job as a bouncer just kind of mobbed up nightclub real high-end nightclub um called brownies on the lake and and, and there i met and got to know bunch of more mob guys like wise guys that more my generation my age you know kind of maybe a little older than me but you know they weren't just the kids from the neighborhood that i grew up with these are guys that are kind of up and coming wise guys and they all had their own little scams and rackets and hustles and things they were doing too they didn't really talk about all of them with me but sometimes we'd get into a discussion about you know how we were making money and and we have a laugh about rackets or whatever but then uh, Tony had me start doing uh, collections, not not a ton of collections at first, but there was a couple things that he had me do that I kind of, in my opinion, they were just tests. You know, is, is this guy going to freaking, is he going to, you know, he, he, he sent me to, he's, this girl had her ex show up drunk and slap her around. I think it was his girlfriend. I can't say for sure. I don't want to say for sure because he didn't say that. He just said, called her a friend. But he called me at like seven in the morning. He says, "Can you go handle that?" I'm like, because the dude is still there. He's passed out. I said, "Yeah, sure, Tony, handle it." He's like, "You sure you can handle it?" I said, "Yeah." And I end up going over there and beating the shit out of the guy. And I'm I'm being beat the shit out, dude. Like, beat him bad. But I like he mangled. He, was, he went right to the hospital. And it just, I had a big nugget ring on, and I just oh yeah, they, messed him up. <laughs> yeah, I probably I only hit him probably five or six times, but that that big ring just took hunks out of him. He was I had a, I had a nugget ring just like that in junior high school. I know what. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it does damage. It does it damage. This wasn't like a little hollow one either underneath. It was solid, bro. It was a big gnarly ring. And uh, anyways, and then I dragged him out, threw him out. So he, he she told the she told Tony, I'm sure. And uh, after that, Tony had me do some other things, and then then it started being where he you know Tony was the 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 boss of the, the gambling world in Detroit. And he didn't 
have his own sports book. Everybody who had a sports book had to pay him. And he would just attach his name to it and protect you from like guys like me, who if he wasn't protected, I might go to you. You're a bookie. You're pulling 20000 a week. I'm saying, nah, man, you're, you're pulling 20 Gs a week. You're going to pay me 2000 bucks a week from now on. I'm going to beat your head in with a baseball bat. You got that? And, and I'm not playing. And then if, if you thought I was playing, I'd freaking knock you out, break your jaw, and you might wake up with a pistol in your mouth. And I'd be like, so you're, you're either paying or, you know, the other, you don't want the other uh, yeah. result. Yeah. So, so that guy, you, whatever, could go to Tony and be like, listen, man, I got this problem, this freaking lunatic L sweating me and then he would say all right well you're with me now and now that you're with me now he says hey you sure you want to, you would say hey you sure you want to sweat me like that because i'm working I'm, I'm with tony now or whatever and then i'd be like oh, okay you know if you're with tony then i gotta back off and so there were guys where they he he would send me to send messages to guys um and he would basically send me give me a guy's number tell me to call him he'd, he'd always start it off like this guy's got a job for you and he'd be like it's construction or something and I think it was really construction. I call the guy and go sit down with him. Like, all right, you know, I'm doing some concrete work. What are we doing? And he's like, what? No, nah, I got this freaking punk. He won't pay. You know, I was just going, this punk is freaking behind on his VIG. And he told me to F off and blah, 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 blah. So I told Tony and, and now he sends you. So, and I'd go, go collect the money. I get a, you know, I get a piece of it. And so I did a lot of that over the years. And then, um, and then I had my own scams and rackets and hustles always going. I was always in some, always into some, you know, I sold weed and sold steroids. Those are my two main things. I did loan sharks some money. I never was a fan of it, but it was easy income. Um, I just hated having to chase it. You know, everybody's got an excuse. They can't pay for whatever reason. It's a kind of a, it's a nightmare situation. But that, all that would require, bro, is like I go to the Tony Giacalone is the one who actually told me to do it. Right after I got out of jail, he's like, what are you doing for money? I'm like, nothing. He's like, you know, you need to put some money on the street. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, you know, you need some sharks some money. I'm like, I don't have any money. He's like, I'll give it to you. I'm like, well, how much? I can still give you 5,000 bucks. You can always get five, 600 a week in VIG. You know, at least you have an income. I said, all right. So he gives me the money. I took a month. I paid him back. And now, now I got all this money. No, two, 3,000 bucks on the street. So I go to the Hazel Park racetrack, which is a horse track, right? Mm -hmm. And there's it's owned by the boss jack toko and his cousin tony's rally but they're never there not that i know of but i never seen see him once and um and all these gambling degenerates would hang out there and they'd all bet all day in the horses they bet sport there'd be like no joke bro there'd be i'm not joking this is another thing like dumbass scott burns he was he's like oh yeah hey. dude there must have been 30 if you couldn't name three bookies because he doesn't know there must have been 30 or 40 bookies there at any, you know, and, it, and maybe at one time you'd see that many. And then the degenerates, I mean, you can imagine how many degenerates would be there. It might be a hundred of them. And they all owed everybody. Like they all owed each other and everybody's scraping for the same dollar to pay Paul, Paul, Rob, Peter, whatever. So I put the money out there. And then, and then when they wouldn't pay, like I got to the point one time, there's a kid named Brandon who owed me 800 bucks. And he was, this was his, the money, this wasn't VIG. This is the money he owed me. He said he'd have it on this day. And that day he didn't. And then he said he'd have it tomorrow. And then that day he didn't. And then the third day he said, I'll have it tomorrow. And he kept saying, meet me back here at the track. I know why you're at the track, mother effort, because you're gambling. Yeah. You don't have my money. So on day three, when I come walking up, I said, you got my money. And he said, no. I was like, bam, just broke his jaw. Just knocked him out. This is in front of like 50 guys. I'm just like, wham. And he goes, flying over the bleachers, bang, 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 bang to the bleachers, and all these freaking guys look over. Now, keep in mind, about 12 of these guys owe me money. So I'm kind of looking at them like, yeah, mother effer, I'm coming for you next, you know, <laughs> have my money. So they all started, like, pulling money out. Here you go, Al, here's my fig. Here, you know, I get the rest of my hour next week. But So, like, you know, I kind of got a reputation it was, that, that was made me look worse or sound worse or seem worse than I really was. I wasn't this monster animal out there crushing people. Although... I was uh, in the nightclubs all the time, knocking mother efforts out. Like they, I, I hated bullies. I hated those. I hated those big steroided out, muscle bound, fake ass, wanna be tough guy type mother guys. You know the kind. They're standing yeah. in the club. They're all puffed up. You know which way is the beach? Kind oh. of freaking dorks. <laughs> you know, and they, and they, like real tough guys, don't act like that. They don't need yeah. to act like that, and they don't. They sit back in the cut in the shadows. They hit on a girl. They may watch, but they're not acting puffed up walking around i've been doing steroids for nine freaking months now look at me I'm, I'm a tough guy that guy right there i'd walk over to him and just like bang banging in my knock his drink out of his hand 
you know, about nine times out of 10 times, they'd be like, oh, sorry, my bad, big dog. And a lot of them knew who I was because, you know, I was in them clubs all the time and they see me knock guys out all the time. They're like, one out of every 10 might be like, man, what the fuck's your problem, man? What the fuck's wrong? And I'd be like, yeah, they, bang. I wouldn't even talk. I'd just be like, wham. That's my problem, man. I'm about to deflate your little bubble. All this fake ass, uh, uh, you know, muscle you got, don't do nothing. I would tell them that sometimes. And I get right in their face. I said, listen, motherfucker. I said, man, all that muscle don't mean nothing, bro. You were a pussy. I, I remember you from nine months ago. I remember you when you first came in here, sitting there all timid in the corner with your boys. Now you've done a bunch of steroids. You walk around like King Kong. I said, you ain't, you're still that little pussy in the corner, bro. And I, and I freaking break your jaw. And I'd say, I recognize who you're talking to, bro. I'm not one of these freaking mother efforts. Sometimes they do it, but am I that rep my reputation for doing that was well known. Like I like it was well known all through the east side and the clubs and the in the whole neighborhood. Everybody knew me like that. And they thought I was a lunatic. They all thought I was a straight, straight cut lunatic because of that. I wasn't a lunatic. I just didn't like those type of mother efforts, man. I yeah. I just I just didn't like them. I I, I mean I did a couple crazy ass lunatic type things over the years. Like, I pulled a knife on a guy in there at one time, but that was a strategic play in the nightclub one time. Big, This big giant dude named Andre, who was, he was with a crew from downriver, and they were scabbing contracts from my cousin up on the east side, and they wanted me to go in there and, like, scare him or kind of intimidate him. And, and so they came with a little muscle, and I knew it was them because I didn't recognize these guys. So the guy was staring me down, man, like like mean mugging me, this big tall mother effort. So I just pulled out a freaking knife, ran grabbed him by the throat and tackled him. And I put a knife to his throat and said, you out of place, mother effort. You in the wrong freaking city, wrong neighborhood. I said, I'll cut your freaking head off in here. And I did that in front of a like a, cr a crowded nightclub with like freaking you know, two, three hundred people standing there. And another time a guy, uh, another time a guy had, um, I I basically had Debo with a pound of weed from a dude. And that's another funny story, but. Basically, his girl um, calls me and said he's threatening to beat me up. Now, his girl was my booty call chick, the chick, my side piece, right? Mm -hmm. She calls me and says, my boyfriend's threatening to beat her ass. I knew the guy. He's a big muscle-bound guy named Jay, but he was a pussy. So he, she's saying he's going to do that. So I go over to the house, and I say, what's the problem? Why are you fighting? He brought all these drugs in the house. What drugs? She says, he's got all these freaking weed in the, in the bedroom. We got a kid. We just had a kid. Yeah, like a one-year-old kid. So we're, I go in the bedroom. It's like 10 pounds of weed sitting on the bed. I said, who's is that? He tells me it's his friends, this other guy named Jay, believe it or not. I said, no, nah, man, I, I knew the guy. And he was a freaking, like a wannabe, a punk, totally. Like he, he thought he was a tough guy. He thought he was a gangster. Listen to what happened. So I said, I walked over and grabbed a pound off the bed. I said, tell him, I said, thanks. That's my cut for him selling weed in my city. He's going to have to pay me one of those every week now. And I said, you, and I said, if you put your hand in this girl, I'll come back and beat your head in. You got that? you can fight and yell she's your baby mama all you want but if you touch her i'll come back and i'll beat your mother up and head and he's like yeah hell, i got it man i got it and i took the weed he's like you just take the weed i said yeah but i'm taking it tell him to call me if he wants to get paid so he calls me on the phone the other guy and starts getting super tough with me talking gangster is hell i mean dude like the mother ever saw too many movies gangster you know what i'm saying yeah just talking shit on the phone like he's a straight like scarface type mother ever and I'm laughing. I'm like, dude, do you? Are you sure you know who this is? Yeah, but but I had been to his house. I knew him. I'd smoked weed with him. I'd been over his house. I'd sold weed to him. So I'm like, are you sure you just you realize this is? He just must not remember. He only knew me when I was like 15 or something. And at this point, I was in my 20s. And, and so he says, yeah, mother. I said, all right. I'll come over to your house. We're gonna talk about this. I just wanted to see how how his gangster was cut. So I'm gonna go to his house. I don't bring a gun or nothing like that. So I'm just gonna tell him f off, you know what I'm saying? First of all, I'm just like, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna pay me. Uh, you're gonna, you're gonna start paying me a cut every week, or I'm gonna freaking tax the shit out of you or beat your ass. I come, the open, the one guy opens the door and he goes, step in. He's got a black trench coat on and he steps back. It's a pretty freaking nice house in St. Clair Shores, Michigan. I walk in and he points at this like kitchen table long in a dining room table and the guy's sitting at the head of the table like Don Corleone would, like right and in front of him's a gun pistol it's on the table now I honestly start to get a little bit nervous you know what I'm saying like because this guy might Bring be so that. mentally Ill. yeah I mean I don't know if he's mentally ill how far like how dumb is he you know what I'm saying so I don't I don't uh, know if he's all there and he's got a gun there, and I don't. And I'm in his house. You know what I'm saying? So now I start getting nervous. Not scared, but I'm nervous. 
He says, sit down. I mean, he plays it just like he's in a movie. Sit down. So I sit down. He slides. Now, now his boy, I sit on the side of the table. He's at the head of the table. His boy sits directly across from me. He slides the gun to his boy in the trench coat. And the guy takes the trench coat. It's a revolver. And he like spins it around, faces me, and right across me. And he says, now you're going to pay us our frick. You're going to pay me my money, mother effer, or you're going to have a problem. And I said, all right, man. If you win, man, I'll go get it. And I got up. And I walked out. So the dude with the trench coat had a thing for this girl named Katie that I that I had dated. And she was a hottie. And and she, and she she had told me about this dude. That's how I knew who he was. And I said, listen, can you I want you to set this guy up so I can get him. Um, do you have a problem with this? And she liked me. And she was from a, a long line of gangster mafia blood. She, I don't, I can't say her last name, cause, you know, but it's a, but it's her, her bloodline is mafia, way but dating back, you know, hundred years. So she, she didn't care at all. She didn't even blink. She's like, yeah, no, get him. I'll help you get him. I said, so listen, where's he hang out? She's like Point Billiards. He, I see him in there all the time. It's like pool hall on, on right on the border of Gross Point in Detroit. I said, tell him you want to go out there, maybe have something to eat, shoot pool, whatever. Bring him there for me. She's like, what are you gonna do? I'm like, you'll see. So. She calls and tells me he's going to be there. She calls and tells me when he's there. She's like, he's here. I only live like two miles away. Uh, this is where I live with my, gra uh, my uh, grandparents. And so I go walking in there. And this is the, the, the reason I'm giving you this story is to illustrate the level of lunatic I was. And this, there's got to be 100, 100 people in this place. Because it's a, a pool hall that would become like a bar club at night. Right. You know yeah. Saying? But it was still pretty early in the night. It was like eight o'clock, so there was like maybe a hundred people milling about, hanging out, yeah. drinking, you know, whatever. It wasn't banging, it wasn't packed, like club popping yet. But it was going to get there by midnight. Yeah, I went walking into there, and the dude is shooting darts, and uh, I just walked up to him and grabbed him by his shirt and just beat the shit out. I said, "Man, gangster, huh?" That's why I said, "You say you think you're a freaking gangster, huh?" Girl, wham, 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 pulverize him. And after I smash him to like a bloody mangled pulp, the whole place was going, "Holy shit, dude! This guy's getting stomped." I pull a pistol out and I shove it in his mouth, like not even light. I'm just like, right in his mouth. I said, "You think you're a gangster, motherfucker? I blow your fucking head off in here. You think I give a fuck?" He's terrified. He don't even know what to say. He's like, like crying, like crying at this point, like hiccuping and crying. So I stomp out of there. And then the dude, the other one, the, the, the original dude whose house it was, whose weed it was, and he was talking that gangster shit on the phone too. I see him walking into a gas station, I don't know, a month later, two months later, wherever it was, at 14 Isle and Gratiot. And uh, he's with his girlfriend and they're both walking into the gas station and I roll up on him and catch him out in front of the store and the gas station and stomp him really bad. Beat him up really bad till he's begging me to stop. Begging me. Screaming. I got him by the hair because he had long blonde hair. Like, like not really long, but kind of long. You know what I'm saying? And I grabbed him. I just was going, wham, just wham, just pounding him. Man. I go, you're a tough guy, huh? You're going to beat my ass? Man. Why ain't you beat my ass now, motherfucker? And this girl's going, stop, please, stop. I'm going to shut up, shut up. And I'm pounding this dude's face and he's begging me, all right, man, stop, man, stop. And he bit you. He was so tough on the phone. You know what I'm saying? That's a typical of, of the world of the day. You know, everybody's a gangster on the keyboard on the phone. So these are the little stories I'm getting at. Is like some of these stories is what gave me a, a kind of reputation or the mystique that I was a lunatic, but I didn't think I was a lunatic. I I, I thought I was uh, strategically crazy, if you will, you know, st strategically violent, but but not so bad. And and, and so yeah, around, I don't know, it's it's around. Uh, 21, two, three, something like that. 23, 24. I got chased down by ATF indictment. And I almost got indicted by the ATF for, for this gun collection that I, I extorted out of a guy who owed a bunch of money. And so I ran to New York for a couple of years and I hid in New York and I was hiding in New York under an alias. And the iron, irony is there when I was in New York, I, of course, naturally would clicked up with some wise guys, some Italian guys. My, my uncle, my, my uncle, you know, ho hooked me up with these freaking guys. So you cut you know, your head. When? Just a second ago. It's bleeding. I did? <laughs> oh, this, yeah, look at your hand. Look at your hand. Oh, yeah, I scratched it. Yeah. Yeah, I get into it. <laughs> <laughs> I just want this freaking lighting. I can't believe it. I didn't know what that was for a second. I thought something was on my screen, and I realized it was blood. <laughs> yeah, get a better look at it. So, um, yeah, 
and I come home from New York, uh, and um, and, but just to give you another prelude, or as I had I battled uh, an addiction over the years because when I was uh 20 years old, living with my grandparents at the same time in my life, I beat a guy up really bad and broke my knuckle, right? So it shattered my knuckle, and um, and it's still jacked up, you know. But, but anyways, I really, it's the worst I ever beat anybody up. And it's not something I'm proud of, you know, because the guy was never the same. Apparently, he spent like a month in the hospital. But in, mentally, he never recovered, which is kind of sad, you know. Um, but I, you know, I paid the price, though, because I broke my knuckle. And that got me addicted to pain pills. And the pain pills led me down a path of like, you know, so I hit heroin and was using drugs. And it lasted maybe six or eight months. And then I got, I got busted with a pistol um, and went to jail for three weeks for the pistol which was actually not bad considering i had a 44 desert eagle i got caught with you know Damn. yeah my grandpa uh, my grandpa and the bondsman ray gonzalez were able to get to the prosecutor and kind of work it out so i only got three weeks i don't know if you ever seen a 44 desert eagle but it thinks a freaking cannon bro. yeah it's a big uh, hanger <laughs> big monster bro and i was sitting there playing with it cleaning it in my front seat of my car while my boy ran into sears to, to uh do a, uh, a scam a credit card scam for me because i i couldn't go in i'd already done all the scam over i said you go in and do it this time so he's in there i'm in the parking lot playing with my gun somebody freaking saw it and reported it and when he comes out and i go to pull off freaking cops swoop up and, then, and that crazy part was the 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 one of the main cops was the dad of one of my friends that bought steroids from me and that dad knew that i sold him steroids that's the crazy thing like the father i go over he goes you selling my son steroids again i'm like eh, no and he's like come on like he knew he's like dude i know what you're doing i know you sell him steroids i don't care you know whatever and it was the one of the cops and i was like yo what's going on they're like you got a gun don't you that's like, so i mean i'm not shooting anybody with it <laughs> so i go to jail for a couple of weeks and i clean myself up off get off the h i'm good I cleaned myself up. I, I get out, try, start training. You know, I, that's the thing. I always worked out. I was always like muscle bound and, and in good shapes. So no one ever knew when I was using drugs. Nobody. And I had a pocket full of money, you know, and, and I had toys. I had always had a ninja, you know, a crotch rock. I had a car, yeah. toys, four wheelers, jet skis, snowmobiles. I, I still go fishing and hunting. I lived a normal life and I worked out. I just had a habit. And then I'd clean up and be like, yeah, now I'm free of this freaking thing. And I'd be clean for like two, three years. And then uh, the next time, what, what happened was my best friend died, um, which really sent me into a downward spiral, man. I, I, the only way I knew how to deal with it was to, to numb my pain was to pop some pills. Yeah. And, um, and then I, I remember the day that I did it. I actually went to his brother's house. I went and got some pills, popped them, went to his house and just sat watching college football with his brother because I just wanted to be by something that reminded me of him, you know. Yeah. I, I had a dream about my best friend last night. So then I cleaned myself up again. And so like over like the eight year period where I used drugs, since when I, from when I broke my finger to uh, when I went, when I went to prison, I had like about three, re, like two or three relapses, Th three all together through. But the last one was the, the, the one that kind of was the, the bad one, you know? So the last one was mainly because, what did it was because I was I played football, semi-pro football in New York, and I don't even like to talk about it because people don't believe it, and I, I understand why. And they they they're like you say you played semi-pro football while you were on the run under an alias, living in New York City. I'm like, yeah. And not only that, but my coach, who was an NFL former NFL player, gave my highlight reel to an NFL agent who said, "Wow, I'd like to get you into a scout NFL combine if you're up for it." I said, "Yes." He said, "I will." And he was going to, and that's when I broke my ankle. So it's kind of this, you can imagine somebody like me at my age, I was in my like late, like mid twenties, like 26 years old, you're 26 years old. And somebody says, and you're really good athlete. I've been an amazing athlete my whole life. Like an incredible athlete, NFL caliber, or even um, major league baseball player caliber too. So, and somebody says to you, by the way, it ain't over. You may have a chance to actually make the big league. So, and you're like, are you serious? This is unbelievable. And so, I mean, this is wow. So all your hopes and dreams are kind of now, that's all you're thinking about. I started training. All I did is train, eat, did everything was focused on my everything. And then, uh, and then I broke my ankle on a, in a fluke accident and it was a gone. And just like that, poof, every dream I ever had since I was four years old, 
because I love football. It was my thing. I loved it. I studied it. I watched every game. Didn't matter if it was high school. Didn't matter if it was flag football. I, I was a scientist at football. I, I loved the game. And so when they just, I said, listen, you got NBA, NFL potential for real. And he told me that this is a, this is an agent, an NFL agent who has a roster of players. He was more of an NBA and major league player, but he had football players too. He called the Detroit Lions while I was in his office with him and said, I'm going to send you the highlight reel. And then like he, he kept waiting for him to call and eventually he called them back. Did you get the reel? And he says, yeah, they said, yes, we did. Impressive. So the only way I could get into a scouting combine was if an a NFL team was to endorse me or invite you basically. Yeah. So, so they said they would. And I, he's like, click, you're going. And it was going to be in Saginaw, Michigan on, at like, like August something or whatever. And I was like, yes, and it'll be it's a couple of weeks away. And I broke my ankle freaking and, and slipped and broke my ankle and it was over. So this sent me down this path of self-destruction of not giving a shit about nothing no more. See what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I stopped caring about life. I stopped caring about everything, everything. I just didn't care anymore. I So I was already like, you know, selling drugs and hustling and doing all kinds of freaking stuff crazy stuff but at this point now i'm like pills dope don't give a shit and when you know when the money run low i had i just bought my second house at the end beautiful house not in crazy house but you know it was beautiful for me i was only 27 when i bought it so it wasn't like it was like a you know for a 27 year old these days a 27 year old can't even imagine owning a house yeah. like i had at 27 and I had two or three cars and a jet boat and a four wheeler and a jet ski and a motorcycle and a dirt bike and blah, blah, blah. But I also had a habit. And then I started gambling too, like a dummy, just because I guess I was chasing something. And uh, I started, I started uh, going to Vegas. And so I, I won the first time I went to Vegas. I won, I won like 14 grand. I'm like, oh, this is easy. You know what I'm saying? And then, of course, now I keep going back and I'm losing. So in the end, Seems to always happen like that. I know, right? I <laughs> freaking got. It's like they got it planned, dude. They have it yeah. figured out. It's like right? you go in there, clean house that first time, and before you know it, you're in there like two weeks, just losing, losing, losing every day. Every time. I know, man. It's crazy, dude. I have to tell one day. Um, I did share my Vegas first time in Vegas story one time, but my wife didn't like it because it involved me hooking up with this girl, so I took it down. <laughs> it was, it's pretty bad. It, it was pretty bad. But I, I need to tell it again with, and just leave that part out. But if you leave that part out, it's not as funny and interesting because it was it was super crazy. Like the the guy I was with was a millionaire, was a baller, and I was with this girl the night before and brought her on a date and hooked up with her on ecstasy. First time I ever did ecstasy. And, um, and uh, and then the next day, he's like, where's that girl? You're never going to see her again. Because I said, ah, I smashed it. He's like, ah, oh, yeah, right. You're lying. You're going to see her again. I said, you want to bet five grand? She's supposed to meet me at 8 o'clock. You'll never see her. This guy's millions, bro. He wouldn't bet me. We were getting in a party bus going to this big dinner. We had, like, this charity dinner. Our bill was 10000 bucks for nine people. Jeez. That was our bill. Ten grand. He didn't care. And I, he's like, she ain't showing up. I'm like, anyway, she showed up. And we bet 500. He wouldn't bet the five grand. I'm like, you pussy. You got for, you worth like $30 million. I'm nobody. I'm like, but he knew once I said bet five grand that, that I, that she was going to be there. And she yeah. showed up and bet 500 bucks. But anyways, so then my life ran its course. Um, when I was 29 years old, I uh, just went down uh, that, that dark, lonely path of self-destruction and nobody was with, with me. Why lonely? I say nobody knew. My girlfriend at the time, I had been with her for 13 years. So, so she's seen me in everything. She never seen me. So she's, she knows that I had fallen into drugs, but she never knew when I was. Yeah. That's how well I hid it. She, that's how well I was able to hide it. Um, then after the fact, I tell her when I was in jail or whatever. And she's like, you know, she, you know, and she paid attention to everything I did, everything. She was an angel. But she didn't know how bad it was. I didn't let people in on my my addiction. Nobody knew how crazy I was. Basically, in the morning, I'd leave and I'd say, give her a kiss and say, listen, all right, I'll see you tonight. And I'd leave and I'd grab a gun and I'd leave. And I wouldn't come back until I had enough money you know, to make sure I had, was good for the next day. And that could have mean robbing a bank. It could mean robbing a drug dealer. It could mean, you know, anybody, anything. And that's what I did. And she, she I come home and I might have a shirt and tie on, you know, or, or dress really nice, you know. And 
she never knew where I was driving a brand new Suzuki Grand Katerra or a Jeep. She's like, you know, where were you today? I'm like, uh, I don't, you know, so did this and that. that. Meanwhile, I was in the street doing gangster stuff, like robbing dope dealers or something with my cousin. He's like shooting these dope dealers. So, anyways, it caught up to me when um, I went on a crime spree essentially at the end. And well, I might as well tell you that I'll finish this part of the story and we'll get on to the rest with why I went into the really bad spiral because I get busted for a uh, bunch of heroin. My girl, my girlfriend's crackhead brother ratted me out, um, said I had a bunch of cocaine, but I didn't have cocaine. I had heroin, like almost two kilos. And the house was in my girlfriend's name, not mine. Um, they couldn't establish that I was there or like they weren't, I wasn't there when they raided the house. The house wasn't in my name. I said, I didn't even live there. They lived there, the brother and the sister. And anyways, they raided the house and there's a young drug dealer. He lives across and down the street from me. He knows everybody in the neighborhood. He's kind of a hustler, tough guy. He's the one who called my girlfriend and said, yo, your house is getting torn up. The feds are in there tearing up your house. So my girl calls me. I'm diving down the street with her crackhead brother, the one who ratted me out. I'm driving. And yeah, she says, what'd you do? What'd you do? What'd you do? I'm like, what the frick do you mean? What'd I do? What'd I do? What do you, what's your problem? What are you talking about? She's like, the neighbor just called, said this freaking, you know, the raid van is there and they're tearing up the house and pulling everything out. And they're in it. And I'm like, no, keep in mind, I got two kilos of heroin in there and 30 pounds of weed in the garage and $40,000 in the, and 30, 33,000 dollars in the, in the, um, Hash in the linen closet. I'm like, I'm screwed. I'm I'm screwed here. This is it. It's game over. And the the dude sitting next to me is the one who made the call. Rat it on. So I basically go on the run. I go on. I go on the run, but I grab my homeboy uh, later that like the next day, right? And I said, listen, you got to do me a favor. And then, this guy wasn't even like a good friend, was, but I, I had to trust him. I said, listen, we're gonna, we pulled to the street behind my house, right? I said, my back window is open, my bedroom. Jump through the back window, go into that linen closet, and see if that cash is there. The cash. And then find, look around and see what they did. So he does this. He comes back, like, you know, 20 minutes later, he jumps the back fence. I know the house is under surveillance, but he, go, he jumps the back fence and goes, you know, through the backyard and jumps to the window. I don't even know if it's under surveillance. In my paranoid mind, it was. Anyway. He goes in there, he finds an uh, affidavit in there that for the search warrant that says what they seized and took. And the, guy, the money's still in the closet. They didn't find it. It was only hidden under some towels, bro. I had like a, a couple towels over these stacks of money, like 33000 bucks. They didn't find it. And he brought it out there in a pillowcase to me. He goes, here's money. No, I needed that money, bro. That was yeah. That was, it was a lifesaver. That's lawyer lawyers. money right there. Right, exactly. <laughs> it was lawyer money. So I couldn't believe it. And um, in the affidavit had all, so I called the cops. It's like, you know, what, what what's this? You raided a, my girlfriend's house, and what's going on? Like, you want to come in and talk? I said, no, but I mean, do I need to, or do I need a lawyer? And he said, come on down, talk to us, blah blah blah. I'm like, do I need a lawyer, bro? Be honest, do I need my lawyer? I'm like, no, no, we're pending lab results right now, and blah blah. blah but you might want to come talk to us. And all right, I go there and talk to him. Long story short, I denied it. It's mine. I had nothing to do with it. Got no fingerprints and no delivery. No, blah, 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 blah. I got nothing. He's like, yeah, maybe we win. Maybe we don't. Who knows? I'm like, yeah, well, you got shit. So bye. And so I leave. Don't think they're going to charge me because they don't have enough evidence to charge me. But everyone in town thinks I'm ratty because I'm not in jail. There's no, there's no arrest record. There's no bond, you know, record, no bail bonds record. No, je- I just, and then my house got raided with all this dope. The guy across the street saw it, and I'm out, so nobody will deal with me, bro. Like, you know, cockroaches in life. Oh, yeah. Everybody, poof, gone. And so my main, my one main drug dealer. And you can't was, you can't blame him for that, though, because no. that's what it looks like. No, I know. Exactly. I don't blame him. I never didn't blame him at all. So my one main blood drug dealer, my cousin Angelo, who's a downriver guy, I owe him for these two kilos of heroin. He's all in front. I owe him one hundred eighty thousand dollars, and it's not like yeah, I know, and it's not like I could just say I I could have said like sorry man I got busted I don't know what to tell you because that would like in my mind I'm like if I don't pay him I'm never gonna be able to make money in this family or do anything ever again or in town, 
So I got to figure out how to pay this freaking guy. Plus, he's my cousin, and I like him. He's my boy. We've been friends, like close friends for like 10 years. Since I was like 21. So like eight, nine years. So I get this black drug dealer, this black weed dealer, um, who I actually liked, sadly. Um, his name is Bebe. And uh, he was selling weed. I, he, he, he went from selling heroin to selling weed because of me. I kept telling him, get out of the heroin game, bro. If you get, he was a heavyweight heroin dealer, kilos. I said, you get busted with a kilo of heroin, man, you're fried, bro. There's no coming back from it. Get in the weed game, bro, and you can sell freaking tons of it. You ain't going to go to jail for a year or two, whatever. It's nothing. And I convinced him, and he did. So he liked me. So I go to his house, and I tell him, I need uh, 200 pounds, you know, 200 pounds of weed. I know he suspected something was weird because I came out of the blue. It was like, I need 200 pounds. And um, so I had him meet me at uh, Eastland Mall in the hood, kind of in the hood. It's eight mile. And he had a pickup truck and I had a pickup truck. I had a, I had a little Jeep truck and he had it in a washing machine like box, right? You know, like a Whirlpool washing machine box, 200 yeah. pounds. And um, he kept getting there. He's like, I said, I got to take it and go get rid of it and I'll bring back the money. He's like, you know, he didn't want to let it go. I was like, bro, relax. You know, you know me for freaking years. I think I'm going to get down. I need to... Then I took the weed and I left and never came back. I give it to Angela. And I give it to Angela. I said, you take this 200 pounds for the 180? He said, yeah, because it was good weed. That dude eventually found me, uh, found where I lived, but I was already in prison by that. He went to my, my house and talked to my girlfriend. He's like, you know, where's Al? She's like, he's in jail for a long freaking time. And he's like, who are you? And he's like, I guess it don't matter. It's baby. <laughs> so he, he freaking, that was that. I felt bad about that, but I do what I do. But the moral of the story is during that period of time for like the last like nine months of my freedom, I was uh, I was grabbing at straws, you know, trying to figure out ways to make money and normally i could just go up to somebody and say front me 20 pounds of weed or front me a freaking half kilo of cocaine or heroin or whatever i want people would do it and the, the guys that knew me friends of mine that were tight who i've never burned i burned a lot of guys i burned 90 percent of the drug dealers of my life i robbed them i just they fronted it to me and i said you know i'm keeping it so get paid like what are you gonna do you yeah. kill me <laughs> what are you gonna do you're not gonna kill me you ain't cut like that so beat it if you come after me make sure you get me that's all because if you miss i'm killing everyone in your family I'd let them know that. You know what I'm saying? I never meant it. I never wanted it to be like that, but I'd let them. You had to put that out there. You had to to let them think that I meant it. And I was good at it. I'm good at letting them think that I, listen, you come after me, you better freaking make sure you get me. If you you miss, I'm killing everyone you love. So just know. And uh, so nobody did. And people aren't dumb, man. So many people are like, you know, in the YouTube sphere or in the world, face social media. They're like, they talk that big game, right? Like, oh, if you would have robbed me, I'd do this. I would have done that. I would do this. Then, you know, I would have killed you. Would've... No, you wouldn't. You're not a killer. It's, you know, I was locked up with killers. I was around killers in the street. And the average guy, I'd walk away, right slap teeth out of your mouth, hand you the pistol and say, cock, load, and shoot. You ain't, pulling, you ain't pulling the trigger. You don't got it in you. You're not cut like that. You're not a Larry Mazel. You're not a cold-blooded killer. You're not going to kill nobody. If somebody steals two pounds, five pounds, ten pounds of weed from you, you're going to kill him you know you won't stop pretending you're not gonna kill him you're, you're faking you're just gonna say i got took what am i gonna do catch a life bit over 10 pounds of weed no yeah, nobody's gonna do stupid. that exactly that doesn't happen so when i did it the guys i knew i picked and choose the guys that i knew i could do it to too you know what i'm saying there were guys who would have been serious like there were guys who would have killed me probably i didn't i stayed away from robbing them you know but the 99.9 percent of these guys they weren't taking shit, you know what I'm saying? And, and, I, and I knew that. So I, I get them. And I did that all the time over the years. I don't always felt bad about it too, man. Like, cause some of the guys were good dudes. Like some of them were actually pretty nice guys and, and I liked them, but I was desperate for money. And I was just like, and you know, it's, I got to take it from somebody. Why not you? You're just a drug dealer. But, um, <laughs> so anyways, you know, you'll make it up cause you're a drug dealer. But, yeah. So anyways, the, la- the last uh, eight, nine months I was, I, I was straight renegade, you know, my uncle Pete, who is always kind of someone who can hook, hook me into a hustle, hook me into a racket, hook me into a scam. He said to me, he's like, what are you doing? You and Johnny shooting, you know, you know with these drug dealers, you know, Johnny had shot a couple of drug dealers and, and, um, and he was under investigation, but for multiple shootings and, and, um, and he's like, what are you doing, man? Like, you're freaking out of your freaking mind. What you? What are you doing? I, I can't. I can't help you, man. You know we got judges and we got prosecutors and we got bail bonds and we got lawyers. We got all this stuff. And yeah, you've always kind of made sure to kick up a portion when I 
when I put you on to a game, he said, but dude, I can't help you, man. If you're out there shooting mother effers and, and, and doing stuff like that, I can't, there's nothing we can do. Yeah. So I'm like, yeah, well, whatever. And I got to get money. I got to get paid. And he, he don't know I'm on heroin. You know what I'm saying? He don't know I got a freaking two, $300 a day right. habit that I got to feed, you know? So, and a nice house and a whole facade of a life I got to support, you know, cars and toys and all this stuff. So I'm just like, whatever, man. So I'm all alone on the street. And I, um, I just, I mean, at the end, I just made me think of a funny story. The one, this one story at the end, this is to tell you how crazy I was, man. I went, walked into a bar, a crowded bar that it was kind of like nine mile in Gratia area. I'd never been in this bar before. It was actually a nine mile. And uh, I walked in and I'm casing this bar out, right? I'm sitting on the bar like this. And I tell the guy, can I get ice, ice water? Place is pretty packed. You know, got to be a hundred people in there. It's a little like pub type of place, right? Sitting at the bar. And uh, I said, can I get an ice water? And I, he says, yeah, I'm getting the ice water. And I'm sitting there and I'm looking around. I'm, scrolling. I'm basically peeping the scene. Like, where's a, where's a victim? Where's a mark? Where Should I rob this place? Or is there someone I can rob? And the guy finally says to me, he's like, hey, man, you know, you have to buy a drink if you're going to stay here and drink ice water. I'm like, I, th- I think he sensed I was what I was doing. Mm-hmm. So I buy, I buy a beer or something. Some dude walks up and sits next to me. He goes, he leans in. He's like, what are you doing, bro? What do you mean, what am I doing? He said, I'm having a beer. What's that? He's like, nah, bro. He's like, you're up to something. I'm like, nah, man. He's like, Mm-mm. he's like, bro, I do the same thing what you're doing. You about to, you about to hit something. And I said, I looked at him and I said, I'm thinking about hitting this freaking cash register right here. And he says, don't do it. I've been watching them all night. They just put the money in the safe. He missed them by like 10 minutes. <laughs> it's like, get out of here. So we ended up, <laughs> so, we, we, so we, we ended up going outside and I said, I, I, I got some counterfeit bills, but I had already burned all my drug dealers with them. Right. He's like, I'm like, take me to your drug dealers, your dealers. I got these counterfeit bills and we can get some dope. So he's like, yeah. All right. So takes, we, he takes me to his dope dealers and I buy, you know, a few hundred dollars of heroin and, and he smoked crack the dude. He's a crackhead. And, you know, and then we came back to do it again. With the same drug dealers a couple hours later. And they're like, oh, I don't want those hundreds. Uh, and we're like, why, you know? And and then so we went to the, uh, the Tim Hortons on on Eight Mile, and I ordered a sandwich and a soup, and uh, I hand the chick a hundred dollar bill, and she won't take it. Not the she's like, I don't have the change, I can't break a hundred, because I think I actually gave her a real hundred at the time, and um, because there was light, it was light, it wasn't at nar- like drug dealer's house at narc, at yeah. front, whatever. It was light out, and she was. She went, she's like, I can't break it. So I go to the gas station and try to break it. And they won't break it. So I come back to just take the freaking hundred dollar bill, break my hundred. She won't do it. So I pull a pistol out. There's this guy in the seat next to me. I pull it. I feel better. This is poor. This is how crazy and out of control I was. The dude don't even know me. He's in the seat next to me. I've been doing crazy shit all night. I pull out my pistol and aim it at the chick and say, give me my mother effing sandwich and soup. And the chick screams pulls the register out, shoots it out the window, the cash register. And I'm like, I don't want the freaking register. I fling it out on the floor. I'm like, give me my super set. Like she hands the bag up over the thing. <laughs> this guy's out. He's out. He took off running. He he just jumped out of the car. He's like, hell no, I'm out of here. This mother has out of his mind, bro. You know? So anyways, that's how out there I was towards, towards the end. And then, uh, and then I got busted for, and I got charged with, um, Extortion, bank robbery, armed robbery, felony firearm, kidnapping, uh, on and on and on. There's totally there was the total I had 17 charges, um, or it was 17 capital charges, and then there was like a bunch of other charges. Capital means they were life, they carried up to life, you know. What I'm saying? Yeah. So, um, but they were floaters. Most of them were like you know one to life or zero to life or whatever. Yeah. Um. So. So what, how old were you when that happened? 29 and like uh, almost 30. I was like a couple months before I turned 30. I was 29. So, and then years total, you wound up getting how many years total? I served 13.3 years. They gave me 13 to 50. Yeah. 13 so, to 50. You served 13.3. Was yeah. that all in one spot or you got, you got bounced around a pretty good bit in here. Oh yeah. I'm all over the place. I went to eight different prisons over 13 years. Yeah. I was bounced all over the place. See, I mean, that's what I'm saying. We got so much ground to cover. Your prison stories are, are fascinating on its own. Um, but one of the things that, you know, when I first, we first met, I knew the Minds of Madness guy who'd done a show on you. Tyler. And like you, yeah, Tyler. 
So not only did you become a novelist in prison, or at least I'm sure you probably already had some of that in you, but not only did you write your book in prison, you also met, you actually knew your wife before, or did y'all just, didn't you no. know her before? Or you didn't know her at all. I didn't, I didn't know her at all. No, no. So how did that, yeah. tell our listeners real quick how that happened. Well, this is just to let you know, I, just a quick side story is this. Yes. When I was in prison, I started, I became a writer. I started, I discovered that I had this, this, this uh, very unique gift um, that I was very, very good at um, as a writer. And I started writing and over 13 years, I wrote nine novels. Um, and then uh, you, you, there's a lot of big readers in prison, you know, a lot of them, everybody's a big reader, but some of them have been down 20, 30 years. That's all they do. And I'd yeah. hand them, my, I'd hand them my manuscripts and they'd be like, you know, they'd come back and go, you know, I can't tell you how many times a guy had went to me and go, dude, I can't believe this is the best book that I've ever read. And it's you wrote it. And I'm like, and I give him another manuscript and I go here, try one of my other ones. And he'd come back and go, I know I said that other one was the best book I read. I think this one's better than that. And they're like, so you get and I, when it now and that happens like a hundred times in a row, you start to go, okay, I'm on to something here. Like I'm, yeah. I'm doing something right. So, and this is, this is my first book when I got out to be a King. It's about a mafia family, believe it or mm -hmm. not. Um, but so I did got really good at that and started writing. And then around 2008, my cousin, Joe, who was like my earth angel, really good dude, kind of also um, kind of a X street guy, wise guy, Italian dude named Joe Rubino. Um, same, did the same thing as me, sold weed, sold steer. He wasn't a tough guy though, but he was big muscle bomb mother, like bigger, but shorter than me, way bigger. And, um, and, but he was told, I want to say he's a total pussy, but he pretty much was, but he, he, he just wasn't a fighting kind of guy, you know, but he was a hustler. And he, used, he, he rode my whole bit with me, you know. He rode my whole bit. He was a Christian. He got out of the game. He moved to Chicago, met a woman, became a Christian, started a life. And he's an amazing human being. It's an awesome dude. Still is today. And he sent me money. He supported me. He did everything for me. And he said, why don't I start you a Facebook page, man? And I'm like, Facebook? What the fuck is that? And he's like, yeah, it's this new <laughs> thing, you know, social media, da, da, da. He's like, maybe, you know. You connect you because I had my my original girlfriend that I was with for 13 years when I got locked up. She stayed with me for like six years, and then I finally said, "Go on with your life." I started sensing things were different. She probably had a boyfriend. I'm like, "Just get the frick out of here. Go on with your life." You know, and you can't wait. You can't wait. Just God, you know, God bless you. I wish you the best. And then I was kind of like gray and empty for like nine months. I had this like gray, empty void. No, no real hope. No, no. No, I just was empty, man. I, I was with the girl for 20 years. She broke my heart. So I'm just sitting here in this gray haze, you know. And my cousin sensed it and said, listen, man, why don't I start your Facebook page and try to hook you up with some of the girls from the neighborhood, some of the old girls. Maybe, maybe you can get some pen pals, something like that. He's like, you know, I, well, so he wrote on there that I'm, I'm doing all this time in prison. I'm writing books in prison. I'm a Christian. Um, you know, and there's pictures of me working out, you know, some of my street pictures that I had in there. And that was it. So one day he starts relaying me messages from people, right. On Facebook, which is cool. He's yeah. JP me, which is this thing like prison email. And then he's saying, you know, did you know this girl named Mervet? She said, she kind of remembered you and she wanted to write you. you think, is that cool? I said, yeah, I don't know who the hell she is, but whatever. So she, hey, I get a, an email, which is JP it's called. And it's from this girl. And um, the, the funny thing is she looked like this girl, like she looked like this girl that I had a one night stand with. And I thought it was her. <laughs> I thought it was her. I thought it was the chick I had a one night stand with when I was bouncing at this club. Uh, it was attached to a hotel, the boardwalk bar and grill and the Easton hotel all in all in one uh, building. It's also an athletic club. And I was working late, man. So I had to stay till like four in the morning to, to work security for the hotel. And these two drunk chicks came in there and one of them like, liked me. And she's like, essentially I went in there and smashed it, this chick and he never said 10 words to her. And I thought it was her, thought it was hers. And I'm like, did I, did, did you and I like, you know, <laughs> bump into each other uh, one time at Rose Shore? She's like, she's like, what? No, no, no. I'm like, are you sure? She's like, yeah, no, it wasn't me. And she would have never been her, but anyway, so she says, listen, I was raised Muslim, born and raised Muslim, but I never practiced. My dad was kind of a dick. He's like a Muslim dictator warlord. He, I, I couldn't go to any school functions. I couldn't do anything in high school. I was kind of like a prisoner myself, so I kind of get it. Um, he tried to marry me off when I was 17 or 18 years old. I refused, so he kicked me out of the house. I moved in with my boyfriend, stayed with him for 10 years. It didn't work out. Uh, then she left him because he was kind of a bump in the log. He just was a lazy ass and 
a, a bit of a bum, you know, and she was ambitious and smart and driven and real talented. And so she ended up dating another guy for a few years, but that didn't work out. And then around this time she bumps into me on an internet. And um, she says, I work for a publisher in New York and I see a writer, you know, and, I'm, and you're a Christian. I'm a new Christian myself. Maybe we could do a Bible study or something, but, and if your book's any good, um, maybe I can, you know, kind of get it in the hands of the right people. And I'm like, hell yeah. You know, of course, you know, when you're in my position, of course you're going to, you're going to, you're going to, yeah, jump on you up and get. Yeah. Yeah. This thing, I got to make sure really quickly. I got my computer wasn't plugged in. So it's a good thing. I didn't get, I, I realized that otherwise it was going to run out of juice. Um, so, I wrote her and she said she wanted my book. So I had my friend turn the book into a PDF file. Now the book was total all together. It was volume one and two of this book. So this 500 pages each or like 550 or whatever it is. So together it was like 1100 pages, the full manuscript. And my boy PDFs it. He didn't even want to send it to her because he was scared she's going to steal it. He was worried she, she's gonna, she could steal it. And you know, I'm like, just send her the freaking book, folks. Well, she's not going to steal it. I'm, I strongly advise you against this as your business consultant. <laughs> blah blah blah. Just send her the freaking book, man. So she takes the book, she gets it, she reads the whole 1,100 pages in three days, and Damn. she's blown away. Yeah, I know. On her phone, bro, a whole 1,100 pages in three days on her phone, and was blown away. She literally said, "She called me a unicorn." She literally said, "You're the unicorn. You're the you're the you're the unicorn that publishers look for." And I'm like, "Yeah, you think so?" She's like. I've read 10,000 books in my life. I worked at the bookstore. I had a literary scholarship in, uh, in high school. She's like, all of high school, I worked in the bookstore, which is ironically the bookstore that I used to go to all the time, but after she worked there. And, um, and she's like, I would put your book in the top three best books I've ever read. And later on, years later, she'd tell me, she'd admit, she's like, your book was the best book I ever read. And she still reads two or three books a week on audio. She listened to audiobooks now. Mm -hmm. but But she... She said, your book was the best book I ever read. I didn't want to blow up your head. You know, I just met you. I didn't want you thinking I'm full of crap, you know, ma'am. So I just said top three. She said, your book was the best book I'd ever read. And, and that's saying a lot. I've read thousands and thousands of books. And she'd done all these big book conferences and public conferences and talked to John Grisham and, and all these big publishers. And she's like, I, I needed to have that book. When I read that book, she's like, my heart needed to have the man that created that story. Cause that was, that was the man for me. She said, that was the guy. So if a man could create those characters and that story, that was the man I want to be with. And so she started writing me and we didn't like have a romantic interest in the beginning. I tried to keep it, you know, platonic and just cool, but we had so many of the same um, interests. She likes the outdoors. She likes, you know, um, camping and the nature and pets and, and the up North. And she likes all the, all the um, wilderness, and all the things that I like. And um, and plus she's super smart, bro. And I'm like I'm like abnormally nerdy, which you don't see. Uh, I'm a super fact nerd, uh, like when it comes to like trivia. And um, she's way worse than me though. But, but she's like she, dude, she's she could go on Jeopardy and beat everybody. I mean, she, that's she's she's like that. And but I'm good at that stuff too. And all I ever watched in prison, all my all my life, only I ever watched is Discovery, History, Nat Geo. And I don't watch nothing but Nat Geo History Discovery Channel. That's it. It's all I've ever watched my entire <laughs> life. And so, even as a little kid, the little nature, Mucho of Omaha, nature, and all that. And she did too. So we were both these nerds. And we had all this information. And we'd give each other trivia, writing letters. And we started writing letters back and forth, having these like trivia contests and all that. And we just were told nerded out for like nine months. And we just wrote letter back and forth. We wrote thousands of pages of letters. I put my seventh novel on hold for a year. For one year, I was three quarters of the way done with my seventh novel. I set it aside and wrote my future wife for a year, nonstop. Wrote her uh, like 60, 70, 80 pages a week letters, just typing books out to her. And she did the same thing to me. We went back and forth. And after like nine months, we're like, let's get on the phone and talk. Got on the phone and talk. And by this point, we were like, you know, let's get married, you know. And she's like, yeah, where do you want to live when you get out? I'm like, up north, away from the city, far from people out in the country. I don't want to see neighbors. I don't want to hear nothing. I just want to hear the crickets and the birds and the animals. And I want to hunt and fish and ride my four-wheeler and ride my dirt bike. And I just want to get just get the F away from puke, you know, like, like civilization. I hate people. 
Now I've been stacked on top of people for 13 years with these stinking loud animals. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to see nobody. You know, I love people. That's the thing. I'm a people person. I, like, I really enjoy people. I enjoy meeting people. I enjoy talking to people. I love people. But, but because of prison, all I want to do is get the F away from people. Yeah. And so, I can imagine. <laughs> so, all right. So, I, when, so she stuck it out, man. She, she committed. And uh, she waited seven years for me, bro. She got, wow. she went up north and got us a place and lived out in the. This chick, that my wife is a badass. I can't give her enough kudos. There's nothing I can say to you. Give it. She, she was a city girl. Moved up in the middle of the country, like five hours away from where she grew up. That's a long ways up in the northern Michigan. Northern Michigan is very remote, bro. It's like Alaska. It's like living in Alaska, bro. I'm telling you. I, where I live is like, it's, it's literally like Alaska. She goes up there. She lived in the middle of Huron National Forest, which was like 2,000 square miles of like uh, wilderness, dude. Legit. She like she had like, in a 20 square mile radius, she had like four neighbors. I mean, <laughs> that's it. And she's out there living by herself. No guns, no dog, nothing. Just her. And she knew that's where you wanted to be when you come out. Right, exactly. She, wow. She, she, and so she sent, would send me pictures all the time and updates, and we'd talk every day on the phone. We talk, we started talking to where we got to where I spent five or 600 bucks a month on the phone with her, you know what I'm saying? Jeez. But, yeah, I mean, that's not that bad. You know, to maintain your relationship, Yeah. Uh, with, no. you know, it's not that big a deal. 600 bucks a month, so what? You know what I mean? It's 150 bucks a week. Plus, she'd send me $100 a week for commissary, too. So that's another 400 bucks a week. And then shoes and this and that. And she supported me. My boy sent me some money too. You know, they all helped her out. But, but um, anyways, so she waited it out like a G. Got us. A, she had this huge badass house, dude. It was like 4,500 4, square foot house on 160 acres, and that's where she wanted me to come home to. And she was gonna buy the house, but only 80 of the acres. And the homeowner said, "Buy the whole 160." She's like, "I can't afford it." And they're like, "Well, then we're selling it to somebody else." And at the last minute, they like they kicked her out. So she, she, I was gonna go home to a forty five hundred square foot like mansion on one hundred and sixty acres, and and then they kicked her out. So she had to go rent this little house. Didn't matter though; it worked out perfectly because where she landed was perfect, bro. It was right on the snowmobile trail, right on the Orby trail. It's only a couple miles away from this awesome river, dude. That was that I that I would find out had was loaded with salmon, it was loaded with trout, it was loaded with fish. Oh man. I wouldn't want it that mansion. I wouldn't even want it. I, 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 we landed exactly where I wanted to be, bro. Right in the middle of the woods on a snowmobile trail. I pull out of my driveway in a snowmobile and drive across the state. I could drive 200 miles right off my driveway on a snowmobile. And I did all the time. And a four-wheeler. And it's it amazing. It's beautiful. So I got out. Um, after 13.3 years, my boys picked me up. Four of my boys. They took me to... Uh, um, Bob Evans, and they gave me a bag of gifts and a, an iPhone, and they're like, you know, welcome home. And then they drove me um, five hours to me, to meet the my wife. She had cooked a big feast for us. Um, it was my first time ever being alone with her, or outside of a prison, uh, you know, setting, um, visiting room. And then I I got married the very next day. My two boys were witnesses, and I got married. And then my cousin. Um, baptized me in Lake Huron. I wanted him to baptize me. Uh, it was a beautiful, beautiful day. It was a really hot summer. So the water, water was super warm. I didn't want to get out. They're like, we got to go. We're you know, running late. I'm like splashing around in this water. Like, you know, keep in mind, 12 hours ago, I was in a prison cell. <laughs> yeah. I was splashing around in this, this like bath water in Lake Huron. Like, man, this is like floating. I'm floating in the water. Like, oh my God, this isn't real. Like, I'm, I can't believe this isn't real. <laughs> So then I, that was it. And I started my next, my life and went from there. So, you, I mean, and you hit the ground running too, pretty much. I mean, you, you know, you, you already had your books done, a large number of your books done. Then you had, when I met you, uh, it was through social media. I think Instagram is how we ri originally met. And then you had your own YouTube channel you'd have for a while. Like I said, we had interviewed a lot of the same people. Um, and especially getting in, me and you are similar because we don't, we interview a lot of different people, yeah. be it authors, uh, drug smugglers. Um, but anyone we also interesting. Know, I don't care yeah. who it is. Yeah, anyone with an interesting story. I mean, I interviewed that kid that was on the run and, and got out of the country to Canada and then came back. I mean, you know, it, it doesn't have to be, but mob stories are very interesting. 
and you obviously have some ties to that, and you had interviewed a lot of mob guys, and you were doing shows with Mazza and all that. But one thing I think we can agree on is when you do those shows, you just there are a group of people that are just they're, they're haters is really the only thing you could put it. And you have a shitload of them, my friend. <laughs> yeah, I, I you know I don't think I have a. But let's see, I think that's a misconception. I actually don't have a shitload of them, but the ones that I have make a lot well, of weight. Yeah, yeah, that that's a better way to put that. You have you have some major ones. I'll put it like that because there's people that just go to great lengths. Yeah. I don't really know why you cannot have a life to dedicate that kind of time, time and um, energy. Yeah, it's the it's hate great. Man, yeah, I, well, there's a, there's a bunch of reasons why, but like like so you know I I found myself kind of pigeonholed into the mafia genre simply because my books are about a mafia family and I have some history in that world you know I kind of grew up in and around a mafia family and so I share a lot of stories um, from my life that are you know they brush against mobsters or mafia. Uh, some of them barely, some none at all, and some yes. Um, these are just facts of my life. But because of that, I got kind of pigeonholed into this mafia genre. Then I had like my friend Larry Mazza. I did book con with him. Um, and then like and now he's a co-host of one of my shows. So he's, you know, obviously he's mafia. And um, so I found myself in that thing. But what happens is th these, there's a, People who know this know this. People who don't will find it fascinating, strange. But there's a strange, very small subset, subculture of like mafia groupies. And these are people who are like really obsessed, abnormally um, hyper focused on all things mafia, mafia gangster. And these are guys who listen to Sammy DeBolf podcasts, you know, 10 times. These are guys who watch Goodfellas 100 times. And there's about some of them actually host have their own like podcasts on YouTube. Um, and they're basically just nobodies, a kind of wannabe type dudes who, who are just have studied everything they can learn and find out about mobsters in Google on Wikipedia on documentaries and kind of memorized it all. And then just go live and talk about it with other nerds like them who will talk back with them. And they found that if they like talk to these nerds, and they engage them, some of those nerds will like donate money and give them super chats and donations. So they're like, oh, this is easy. I, every day I just go live, I pick a topic about Sammy DeVol, and, and then next thing you know, I get two or 300 little of these weird mob groupies jump on there and they're like, hey, I don't like Sammy, Sammy's this. And other guy's like, I love Sammy, he's the most gangster guy ever. He's screw John Gotti. And someone's like, hey, Gotti, he's my guy. And they go back and forth. And, they, and the guy like who's having the show moderating is going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, just give me money. Like he's going, <laughs> Ching, ching, so they give them five dollars and ten dollars. You know, they're like these little super chats, like lunch money. You know, the yeah. money. these are primarily kids that they live with their mother or, um, or their aunt, uncle, whoever. I imagine a lot of them are on disability, on uh, SSI, disability welfare. They really don't have any life. They can't even afford Netflix or, or HBO, so they they got this. That's their thing. But so with me, so these are people who who like they've never done any. They've never picked up a gun. They never robbed, beat, stole, did anything gangster thing in their life, right? But they love all things gangster. And then they yeah. hear me sharing stories, and here's the first thing they think is, Limbloom, that's not Italian. That's not mafia. And he doesn't talk like Tony, to, you know, like he goes, hey, Tony, hey, Paul, where's my gun? Go get the papers. But I don't, because I don't sound like that, I can't, I must not be real. I'm a fake. I'm a fake. I uh, can't be the mafia. And it's fake. And so they, they, it, a lot of them are East Coast like groupies for sure. And um, so I'm a guy who's done a lot of stuff. You know, I've I've robbed and beaten and scammed and done all million, every racket imaginable. You know, and I paid the price. I did time for it. You know, I did time for extortion, bank robbery, arm robbery, on and on and on. And so they they because they never have done anything, I guess. And I have, I guess, and they don't have a story, and I do. It somehow it eats at their little very finite psyche, you know. They it bothers them, I guess. And so they they attack me and they try to get me to try to find things to hem me up, trip me up where I might have uh, misspoke here. And then they'll say, I said a lie there. I never did. They never caught me in a lie and no lie. I never, I, I might've said I lived in Gross Point when in fact I lived in St. Clair Shores, just because I had previously said I lived in St. Clair or Gross Point, which is basically the same thing as St. Clair Shores. Or I might've said the one time they, uh, the big, the big reveal was when I said Joe Toko was my, I thought Joe Toko was my great grandfather based on a conversation I had with Scott Bernstein 
And it turns out Sam Toko was my great grandfather. But the, during the conversation <clears throat> with Scott Bernstein, we were he was talking about Joe Toko, how the guy was murdered, and they may believe this is this conversation he claims he doesn't remember. But I know I've, we had it multiple times, so I know it's right. He said that there the guy may have been murdered. It, it had to do with some money and some stocks and this that, but it may have been because he was cheating, uh, or he was sleeping with another made guy's wife. Now, when I asked my my own grandfather who's my great grandfather was, I maybe asked like twice when I was a kid, 14, 15 years old, and you just don't care. He was dead before I ever was, you know, I, I know. I, I said, I might have asked him. And he's, every time I'd ask him, he'd go speak in Sicilian and say something to my grandmother. And I could tell he didn't want to talk about it. So my grandmother was like, yeah, leave him know. So I'm like, I wonder why grandpa doesn't want to talk, of his, talk about his father. So then when Scott, I said, it was Scott. I said, do you think Joe Toko could have been my great grandfather since he was murdered and there were the women is involved? And maybe that's why my grandpa doesn't want to talk about it. And he said, yeah. Yeah, that could be. So he basically said twice, the exact same reaction twice. He said, yeah, yeah, it could be. So he, I, I was like, all right, well, Joe Toko, it makes sense. I mean, why wouldn't it make sense? Well, so the nerds did a genealogy. That. And they literally did a genealogy thing and said, these Santo was his, his great grandfather, not Pal Joe. I'm like, who cares? I don't even know. I would never know the freaking guy. He was a dead dude. You know what I'm saying? All my stories I talk about are me, my stories. This is what I did. I don't tell you trivia i don't tell you about stats and facts and, and and things that other guys did dead guys did i don't talk i'm not talking about none of that i'm not a historian i'm not a buff i don't give a shit about the mob i just tell you what i did i don't care what so a few times i got i i may have said things like that and and said the wrong thing um and i own up to that but these guys they will make they've made videos and they take things out of context and they got a whole fucking channel dedicated to you <laughs> yeah, I know. I, know. I don't. I think, that that would be. I don't know. I would maybe even take that as a uh, compliment. Yeah, a compliment. Cause yeah, dude. Like, I hey. tell them that. I hope. I hope you continue to do this for the rest of my life, because a, you just look like a spastic, obsessed retard, and b, it just puts my name in the air. You know what I'm saying? Nobody cares. Nobody cares what you're saying. You, you know what I'm saying? Why? Why would even care? Like. People who go now, people who never even knew me will go to my channel and listen to my my stuff and go, wow, this guy's got great stories. This guy's interesting. Or this guy's got awesome books. You know, look at the reviews on his books, whatever. These freaking spastic. But they did they did consequently uh achieve getting my YouTube channel taken down. That's what I was gonna talk to you about, because you know, it, as a YouTuber, as a concrete content creator, you kind of have to ride a fine line. Yeah. And if you get too involved with your audience, sometimes that can backfire. Cause yeah. I remember I told you one time, I said, man, I got my first hater. A dude done a video and I'm not even going to mention his name. Cause I don't want anybody to even give him any fucking views. He can do that to me if he wants. Uh, but I had a guest on my show, Anthony Ramundi, who, who, you know, you interviewed him as well. And somebody didn't like him and made a full, like four or five minute video, just talking in the street about, you know, me and me having him on. And like, I was about ready to fire away and i did comment a few things but then after that i'm like you know what I, it's not even worth it i'm gonna let him just keep doing that and it'll drive people to go see the interview that he's talking about so it's giving me views and i left it alone but i noticed in some of your videos and your chats you would fire back you would come back at him and yeah. is that kind of ultimately what led to getting your channel pulled I'm sure. I'm sure. You know, as a writer, I'm very good with words. I can I can just slice people apart. Right, I mean, because you don't do com you don't do one word comments. You do you, know, you do yeah. big I'll write a freaking paragraph <laughs> and I will just just I'll I will make you want to kill yourself. You know what I'm saying? And that's what I would do. I would just demolish these freaking guys and in, in, in the end it drove them nuts and they, there's nothing they could really do. The best part was when my wife did a video kind of rebutting these idiots. Like so my wife did a video and literally did a, spent an hour giving my genealogy and then presenting all the facts that Scott Bernstein didn't present, presenting all the lies that he did, made and all these things that regarded me all the omissions and also the full genealogies A to B and in, instantly they all went Quiet. Now nobody made a peep. Basically, uh, Lee Cole's like, eat church crickets, crickets, crickets. I'm like, exactly. You guys are a bunch of freaking idiots. Stop spazzing and obsessing over another man. But yeah, I would go ham on them, and um, and that's what ultimately happened. Where one of them was, I, I will give him this. I, I will give him this. He's he was clever enough to do two very remarkable things. First, he was able to infiltrate 
Scott Bernstein's mind and convinced Scott Bernstein, who was my friend for five years, who knew everything about me. Uh, and then to, to, they, he had, was able to convince him that the mafia in Detroit was literally mad at Scott over me for me allowing me to use his name to endorse him, which I never did. I just said, I made reference to him. Like I had a conversation with Scott about Joe Toko and this is how it went. And he, Scott got so scared. Well, these guys got in his head and told him and convinced him that, that the, the mob was mad at him, which is ridiculous. It's absurd. And mad at him for what? For, 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 for me saying I had a conversation with you. I mean, you write books about their entire life. You write articles weekly about everything they do. If they go to court, you're in the courtroom writing everything down. They hate you. They don't care if I tell a story from 30 years ago about freaking how I did a, I collected for some, one of their uncles or something. I mean, that's ridiculous. But the one guy was able to trick Scott by saying, I know where the boss lives. Here's his address. And Scott knew that was the real address. So because, because the nerd, the troll had gone to high school with the boss's son. So he was able to say, I know where the boss lives and I know the boss and he's mad at you because it's got, anyways, they commit something infiltrated Scott's mind and they, Scott got scared and distanced himself from me. I don't know. I don't even know Gunner. Basically that's what he did. Gunner. I don't, I don't know Gunner. I, know, I met him once or twice. I barely talked to him. I don't know. Meanwhile, here's a guy who called me 137 times in 14 months. That's the last 14 months leading up to when this all happened. I have my phone records. I put them in this video. My wife did. 137 phone calls for 32 hours of phone calls, 32 hours of phone call. Here's the guy who said he barely knew me. You know, I got pictures of like me and out to dinner with him like 20 freaking times, literally. So he was a liar, but whatever. He was trying to cover up. He was scared, whatever. And then the other thing they did was they figured out that they can, they were, if they, I don't know how they figured it out. Somebody must have, they must talk. Well, these are people, like you said, who have no life. They have zero life. So they don't work. Um, I think this particular one lives off an inheritance. I guess grandpa died. So he left him some money. And so he's kind of uh, independently, not wealthy, but secure. Um, and anyway, so he doesn't have to work. So all he does is get drunk every day and then spends his entire life on YouTube. And, and he's got like 12 different accounts. He subs, subs to like 37 channels. He bounces into everyone under different names. He becomes friends with anyone who will be friends with him and every name. Well, somehow somebody told him, like, if you report a channel for giving disinformation regarding the election, they'll strike them. You know, and you don't even have to. Ha it doesn't even have to be like that. Like they don't even have to say election. Just report it to YouTube that they're saying they're talking about the election disinformation or they're claiming the election was rigged and bang, they'll strike you. And they did. Now, the first time they did it to me, and they claimed the video, and I looked at the video, I'm like, I never even mentioned the election. That's weird, but whatever. Second time it happened, it was me and Larry Mazza. I went back and looked at the video again. And actually, it was the first time. The second one was me and um, uh, Lou Velo Velozzi, the uh Yeah, the, undercover the, guy. Yeah. Yeah. We were, we were talking some politics, but we hadn't talked about the election, really. And then I had the, uh, the other uh, ATF guy, too, Anyways, and I just Ignisio? knew it that, huh? Ignacio? Yeah, exactly. I can't remember if it was him or not. But the, at the end of the day, I knew by strike two that my channel was going to get taken down. So I called my boy, my co my co my co host Bill Crooks, who's a tech guy, and said, "Can you back up all my stuff?" And he did. So he spent four days downloading my entire channel, eight eight hundred videos. He's got them all. A lot. Yeah, 800 videos. Well, I had 400 shows, 409 shows, and with a total of four, four, five, 800 videos, he's on like some terabyte freaking thing and whatever. So I knew it was coming. I knew that if they can just report you and get you struck struck for something you didn't do, then they're gonna keep doing it. They're gonna they're just they're they're weasels. You know, they got no life. They hate me to the point where. But the thing was, bro. Here's the thing. I didn't give a shit. Like I just said, hey, back these up. I'll go to Rumble. And the main reason is because I made. Like on the best month I ever had in YouTube, I made like thirteen hundred bucks, right? And that's before they all started attacking me because one of the reasons I, they all attacked me is because I flat out said at some point, "Listen, if you're one of these mob groupies who are just there to hear mafia stats, facts, trivia, and all these things, I'm the, I'm the wrong channel. I'm not the guy. I don't talk about that stuff. I don't know nothing about it. I don't know nothing about mafia stats and facts and dead guys and I don't give a shit. It's not my thing. If that's what you're after, I'm not the channel. So if you're a mob groupie, I'm sorry. 
and you haven't bought my book, if you've been watching my channel for two years and you haven't bought my book yet, please unsub me, I said. You're not the guy I'm after. You're not the market I'm after. Said, my books are being called the next Godfather. They literally are people saying it's the greatest mafia story that's ever been written. So if you're a fan of the mafia genre and you like mafia stuff, and here's the guy you've been watching for two years, people saying that he wrote the greatest mafia story that's ever been told. You've watched a hundred of his shows and they're gangster as hell and you like him and you can't spend $20 to buy a novel, what his novel to support him. I said, please, by all means, unsub me. And they all freaking went to each other in their own little sub chats. And they, oh my God, Gunner is saying unsub. Gunner's begging for money. He says, you got to buy his book or don't watch the channel. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, bro, I'm here to sell books. I sell merch too. I own Art Thing Apparel. You can see the, the logo and stuff in the background. Mm -hmm. I'm like, if you don't buy merch and if you don't buy my books, I don't give a shit about Super Chat. I don't want super chats. I don't need money. I'm not looking for handouts. I'm not looking for freaking your donations and your 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 uh lunch money that mom gave you for Uber Eats. I don't care. I have a tangible commodity. I sell a dope a line of apparel. I got badass leather coats. I got all kinds of shit. And I got a badass book. If you that's what I'm here to sell. And if you don't, if you're not buying it because you're broken, you're a bum, I said, please bounce. And they all got together and they started attacking me and all my my numbers went down, 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 but it didn't matter because I wasn't making money anyway. You know, so I, yes, my number went from twelve hundred bucks a month in income on YouTube to like two hundred dollars a month, and it's a thousand bucks is a thousand bucks, but it still ain't shit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like a, th like a thousand bucks, I'm not gonna miss it. It's like so what? I don't care. I'm not gonna pander to a bunch of freaking mob geeky groupy dweebs. You know, so I. Can I got one money. of your track suits. I actually like. <laughs> track suits are dope, man. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love them. I wore it. Uh, matter of fact, I, I think I sent you a picture. I wore it when I went to my kid had one of his uh, 707 football tournaments, and I wore yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. It was our one of our leather coats. They're dope. I uh, all our stuff is dope. Our track suits are dope. I mean, anything. Anyways, that's what I'm here to do. Sell that. I'm not here to freaking beg for money like you know FBS and all these freaking guys. They're like, please super chat or I'll, I'll, I'll well, uh, if you don't give me money, I'm just gonna go back to bed. Or, or like, I don't care. I'm here to share a story, buy a book, buy some merch, and then dip. That's it. I have a tangible asset and commodities. So, anyways, so by them getting my channel taken down, they really didn't affect me. All they did is um, give me more time to work on my new book, which is a political thriller, um, which is going to be dope. It's called Blind Sight 2030. It's kind of um takes place in the year 2030, kind of the collapse of uh, American society in the year 2030. China uh, decides to take us to war. Hell, it uh, might not be far from the truth here. Uh, dude, you have no idea. If you read my book, you'd be like, oh, my God. If Once you read my book, that's the thing that's going to be freaking eye-opening to a lot of people awakening. They're going to read my book, and they're going to go, oh my God, if they did this in this fashion, in this order, or this sequence, we're fucked. I mean, we're screwed. I'm like, yeah, we could be. So enjoy the book while you can, because this had, <laughs> they, decide, they decide to do what's in this book. It's over for America. So I got more time to do that. I do a lot of fishing and hunting and four wheeling and playing and trying. I don't really, I'm not, if, if I'm making $200 a month off of YouTube, but I'm putting, you know, 60 hours a month into it. What's the point? It's a joke. Yeah. I mean, it's, I'm not making no money. I'm not, it's, and maybe I sell 10 books. Maybe I sell 20 books. Maybe I sell 30 books. But so what? So I get 450 a royalty. So I sell, even if I sold a hundred books in a month, which just happens. But I mean, if that's it, I make 450 bucks. It ain't worth it. It ain't worth the time. So they, they act like they win. Oh, we got Gunner. We got him off the air. Hey, we win. Hey, we... Now he did me a favor, mother effort, because now I'm going to Rumble. And guess who's at Rumble? Educated intellectual people. People, there's a, a class of people over at Rumble who aren't little mob dweebs who freaking go, he's got 70 bulls, my idol. I love him. You know what I'm saying? That these are these are educated, like more um professionals type of people. So I'll build my market up from there. Free speech, I'll talk about the election. I'll talk about anything the F I want to talk about there and won't get censored. I already got people like that. I started my rumble yesterday and I've already got like 50 people joined in the last day. And I'll just keep and people will keep joining and they do a much by the way at Rumble, you know, YouTube only gives you like um I think what is it? 17% of the uh, the ad revenue, where at Rumble they give you like 80%. Oh really? Yeah, eighty percent, and it's, it's just there's, and then they do the same. They have super chats, same thing where they only it's it's called um, rumbles. They call them rumble sticks or something like that. Rumbles, but it's like a super chat. But you know, on YouTube, uh, they keep thirty percent. 
what, what a shakedown that is. Like somebody wants to give me money and you you're gonna grab thirty percent. It should be like three percent, dude. You know what I mean? Like that's yeah, higher than most of the mob guys. Right, thirty freaking percent. I'm like, <laughs> why? I mean, not three percent or five percent or ten. Thirty. I'm like, are you kidding me? So f you. Now I'll go over to Rumble and I'll post my videos. I'm gonna do my same show with Larry Mazza. My Rumble, by the way, anyone who's watching this is Gunner Detroit. So go to Rumble. It's the future in that kind of uh, that type of uh, media. It's it's not censored like youtube is absolutely censored you can't talk about politics you can't talk about anything unless it's a left-leaning full-blown narrative then you're shut down you can't say nothing and if you do speak up bang they'll they'll, they'll strike you and say don't let it happen again do it again bang strike you again let it happen three times they'll, t- they'll delete your channel 800 and some videos they just took from me stole my own ip that i own that if i hadn't backed it up on my own gone there's gone this is the type of Nazi, Nazi environment we're in. We're involved in. This is just, this is how you know these fascist regimes begin. This is how Stalin started. This is how uh, um, Hitler started. They silenced the opposition, and 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 control the media narrative. And then after several years, there is no opposition. Everybody's brainwashed. It's either do what we say, take what we give you, or we'll kill you. And so right now, that's the route we're going. So, but at Rumble, there's the, there's a whole um, demographic of, of content creators, um, thousands and thousands of them that are going over there for free speech, and it's just a better, freer platform that pays better. And same thing, you go, it's just like YouTube. You watch a channel, so you just subscribe. I have like five channels there, right? Just I have my my Garner Detroit. And then there's like I have off the cuffs, which is my outdoor stuff. Then I have interviews. Then I have um, you know stories, and I have all these. There's like five different channels. I I just started uploading today, but um, but I I have all those other videos. You got so, a lot to upload. <laughs> yeah, I, I could be. I'll be uploading for the next two years. So, and I, I got a lot of great stories. Like all my best stories too were like my first couple hundred shows, and like people who have come to my channel like, dude, I love your shows. Your stories are awesome, man. You need to share more stories. I'm like, have you watched my first two hundred? They're like, no. I'm like, dude, you've missed it. You missed out. My first two hundred shows are just some of my craziest best ones but the you know the sound quality wasn't as good i didn't have good sound i, I didn't have best like lighting and stuff i just i'm like ah, i recorded it on my macbook i was like eh, and it's crazy it how when i run across people and they be like eh, and there's people that i've known for a long time that they're oh i didn't realize you had a podcast i seen last week's episode and i'm like oh would you see this one or this one and it's like no i was like would you go you know you can go back and watch them from the beginning right. they like it's like they don't know that and I'm like, yeah, there was like a whole backlog on there. That, like when I first started and you, and I enjoy this and you, you, you know, me in the spot that I'm at, I don't make a ton of money from YouTube either. Unless you're in like the Rogan territory. I mean, you're not going to make a living off YouTube, but I genuinely enjoy being able to conversate and speak with these guys. This, this travel, you know, roads that I've never traveled done things I've never done. And, and, you know, live through their experiences and then relay that on to, to everybody else. I've never, not one time looked at this as like, God, I got to do this interview. I mean, I, I genuinely look forward to it. It's the complete yeah. opposite. I, I look forward to it, you know, being able to talk with all these guys and, you know, me and you have interviewed some of the same people and, you know, fascinating stories like Tim McBride and Brian O'Day and oh, Amy yeah. Estabal, Lou Velozzi, who we mentioned. I mean, just crazy stories that, you know, I think people would enjoy, especially guys. I mean, a lot of our stuff are, are catered to guys. A lot of those people enjoy it. Yeah, you've had some awesome guests. Are you kidding me, man? You're killing the game, man. Uh, you, you For a guy who's jumped right in feet first, you freaking got some great guests. You probably, I mean, I know that's kind of unprecedented. You've had Tom Sizemore. You had uh, Chong. I mean, you've had some serious guys that even even I'm impressed. It's like, whoa. And But, yeah, you enjoy it. And the thing is, I think the, what attracts those those type of guests to someone like you is because you do genuinely enjoy it. They can yeah. see that. And they're like, well, this guy really wants to hear my story. It's not just a job. I, I, I enjoy it too, talking to people too, but it is it was part of my job. So ultimately at the end of the day, I'm, gonna tr- I'm trying to try to sell you a book or to sell you some merch. Right. Um, if I had a choice, I'd rather be fishing. You know, I'm, I'm a fisherman, I like to fish. I'd rather be out riding my four wheeler or doing something. Else. But I do love interesting stories because, because I have an interesting story myself. I can relate to and, uh, and appreciate uh, interesting stories. And so, I like to have these guys on, but it's, it's not like a, it's not, to me, it wasn't like a big, like a big job. 
but it's still a job and you should be compensated for it. Yeah, there's a lot of behind the scenes work that that at least I put into it as a as a production because I do on audio, also I do video, um, and there's a lot of work. You know, you can just yeah. cut something and post it, or you can go to the extent of doing a little intro, and then yeah. you can go that next step of adding pictures. So it all depends on how much work you want to put into it. Um, to me, I think if I'm putting up a video, that video is a reflection of me. So I want to make sure it's the best product that I can be. And I love to be able to bounce things off people that have done this before because I knew knew nobody or nothing when I got in this game. It was all people that helped me out with information and throwing guests my way like yourself. Um, I bet we, we probably messaged back and forth a bunch on our first interaction on Instagram, and we've been talking for it's probably close to a year now, I'd imagine, or pretty close to it. Yeah. Um, and that's just how I did it, man. I've done it with, you know, networking and talking to people. I tell people all the time, networking will get you farther and get you into places that degrees will never even fucking think about. Oh, dude, you're so right. I used to not believe that. I used to believe that talent is what will get you the farthest thing in life. But, and, and it still will, you know, true talent will always take you, take you where you're trying to get. Yeah. But, but also networking and connecting with the right people is uh, is also is equally important and sometimes more important. Uh, I just had a Australian movie producer or, or television producer reach out to me a couple of days ago. He wants to take my life story, particularly my love story with my wife and that part of my story, and can it do like a six to nine part uh, episode or mini series? And like, um, and I, I said, what kind of money you got, you know? And he's like, one point three to one point seven million per episode. I'm like, uh, yeah, you're serious. <laughs> So, so, I mean, he's a guy who's, well, he was a lawyer for 43 years in Australia. So he's got long bread, you know I mean? He yeah. always, he was, he was the head of his own law firm. He started for 43 years. So he's got, you know, he's probably worth $50 million or something. So anyways, I said, yeah, dude, if you're serious, let's talk or well, whatever. But he it admitted with me yesterday, he's like, really it comes down, you know, who, you know, these days, he's like, my production partner is a big shot. He's got a bunch of award-winning shows, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, if you have money, that opens up doors to connections that I can never get. You see what I'm saying? If I knock on doors to my Hollywood friends and I have some Hollywood friends, you know who they are. And if I say, Hey, I want to get my book made or show made on myself. And the first thing out of their mouth is like, how much money you got? Like, what is your budget? Like, how are you going to get to the the producers? I'm like, I don't have a budget, but I got a great story. They're like, come back when you get a budget. Where am I going to get a budget? Like, you got to find somebody with money. So I didn't, so it just it's your full circle. You keep going in circles. So if I knock on the door and say, "Listen, I want to make this movie, and I got twelve million dollars to start with," they're come like, "Come on in, <laughs> come on in." I got a guy. We call him. Yeah. We get another ten from him, another five from him. We make have, a movie. Have a seat. Make you a drink. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's exactly. a lot different introduction. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're best buds now. So, <laughs> that's how, but that's the same everywhere. And a guy like like Louis Lombardi, for example, my friend who was an actor on The Sopranos. Mm-hmm. I got to hook you up with him, but. He, he he would never like say it that way, like kind of sounding like a slimy. Come on, in. like you got the money. Come on in. But no, he'd come right out and just say, "Hey, this is how it works." Like I love to work with you, regardless. But the only way you're gonna get in that door is if you come to me with some money. If you got if you got a couple million dollars, at least they and you can show it to me escrow. Then I can go to my people and say, "Here's a guy who's got a couple million dollars. He's a serious guy. He's not just." got a fantasy here he's serious and then he can go to a guy and get a couple more million and get and before you know it, a year goes by we've raised 12 million dollars and we got a cast and we got a blah 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 and you get a movie or show or whatever but you know it is what it is it's who you it is a lot in hollywood and entertainment it is who you know and that's another reason i don't care about youtube it's like and no offense to you or, or any youtuber at all god bless you all i want you to reach the most attainable uh, like the 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 highest levels of success, you know, I have friends, by the way, uh, like my friend Josh from 23 and one, he's got like 750,000 subscribers. My friend, Sean Atwood, I think he's got 800,000 subscribers. Yeah. So, I mean, and that, um, just, I, there's a lot of, I have a few other YouTube friends who got, they're making big money. You know what I'm saying? Even Sammy the Bull, weasel that he is, he said, he's a great storyteller. And, and so he's making, he's making some money. Michael Francis, another friend of mine who I talk to all the time. He, he, he he's making a living. He's, that's a legit like he makes a lot of money from his speaking engagements and stuff like that. Right, but, yeah. But he but he's still from YouTube. He's he's clocking. You know he's doing good. He's probably making three four hundred grand a year, probably just off his YouTube from sponsors and endorsements and and all that stuff plus speaking gigs whatever. 
But um, so God bless them. But I'm never going to be a YouTube superstar. I'm not Michael Francis. I'm not Sammy the Bull. I never wanted to be a YouTube superstar. I never set out to be a YouTube star. I never intended to be one. I, I am a novelist. That's what I do. I write novels. I'm very, very good at it. And that's what I do. So I'm either going to get sell a million of these right here. Or I'm going to get a book made into a movie and make millions doing that. One or the other. That's my that's my job. Then I'm going to go do a lot of fishing. You won't see me anymore. Until then, <laughs> you might see me on YouTube or Rumble or whatever. But um, it's not my career. It's nothing that I, I I've ever, you know, I'm not set out to be a YouTube sensation. You know, I had eight thousand subscribers when they when they took me down. Yeah. And that's a lot of subscribers, 8,000 subscribers. It took a couple years to get like that. And I've been on Vlad. I've been on Fox News. I've been on some big shows, 23 and 1, Sean Adwood, um, Jordan Harbinger, all these. And so I'm mean, to get to that 8,000, it, it took a while. But, you know, between the haters and the groupies and the spazoids, and it, it, it just became where it's not fun anymore. You know what I mean? This yeah, wasn't man. worth it. And that can happen. Um, it's unfortunate, but I loved uh, your stuff, especially with Maz. I'm a big sports guy anyway, um, gambling and stuff like that. So I loved your show. If I wasn't doing a show on my own on Thursdays, generally you would see me in the chats uh, yeah. with you guys watching along, and I enjoyed that. Matter of fact, I wanna, I'm coming up uh, possibly going to do something you know, similar to like that with you know, just talking sports. I love to talk sports, um, and I know that's not everybody's thing because some people aren't into sports, but – I am, and I love it, and I love football, and I love betting, and you know things like that. And it's becoming more and more normal now, especially with FanDuel and and things like that. And I, I talked with a lot of these mob guys about you know how bookmaking and all that was a money maker for them for years, and now they're, it's on commercials every time, every yeah. every other commercial is a FanDuel or you know DraftKings or something well, like let that. Let me just say, so people who don't know, me and Larry Mazza who's a former Colombo uh, crime family mob hitman, whatever. We do a show every week, every Thursday, typically on YouTube, where it's called The Game Plan, and Larry Mazza handicaps. He gives his picks of the week. He's a professional handicapper. He's a uh, betting a sports book consultant for an offshore account in Costa Rica, and he's very, very good at what he does. And he bats at um, maybe 67 68% all the time. His, his horse betting is like, 80 percent he's just really good at what he does he's crazy on the horses <laughs> yeah i know his horses are freaking good he's killing it. i don't know he's like he's got some kind of magic freaking like horseshoe or something i don't yeah, know horse whisperer or something <laughs> horse whisperer he's good at them man it's natural he just knows he can watch and it's, he's super talented and very impressive but anyways you want to watch their, our show we're going to continue to be posting our show our thursday show but you'll you'll see it on thursday evening so I will record the show with Larry around 5.30 to 6.30, and around 6, 7, 7.30, the show will be posted on my Rumble. So you can check it out. Okay. And then we're going to have – you can get a, also get a, a subscription uh, where you get two more shows, Saturday and Tuesday show. It's 25 bucks a month. It's, it's $25 a month, and he gives you all his picks all week long. And these are – for 25 bucks, these dude, he's charging you – what some of these services charges three hundred dollars a week to give you these this handicapping stuff. Oh yeah, twenty five bucks a month. So you join my Patreon at the twenty five dollar level, and then you'll get two shows of Larry a week live of him giving you his sport like Saturday college picks, and his Tuesday pick. So anything anybody's interested in that, go to my Patreon, which is uh, Patreon backslash Gunner Detroit, or um, hit me up. Yeah, I'll put all those links in the description. I'll put links to your books there, links to your Rumble. Um, you know, so the guys can follow along and keep up with you. For those who don't know why they're not going to see you anymore on YouTube, they can kind of get the story here. And uh, I'm a fan. I can vouch for Miles' picks. I mean, I've listened to some of his football picks. I've listened to some of his baseball picks. And, you know, even the hockey, when hockey was going on last year, and I've never bet horses in my life. I know absolutely nothing about it, but I followed his advice on some, and it's uh, it's profited. So he's uh, he's not just some guy looking at a paper and just picking no. picking sides, I can tell you that. No. I got regrets, man. Had I, if I would have just taken like five racks, right? And st when I started doing the show with Larry, if I would have just taken five racks, you know, and said, "Larry, just double up my these five on your, you know, whatever you whatever you say," I'd have like a hundred grand right now. I mean, I've just yeah. we've been doing it for like I don't know, a year and a half or whatever. I mean, it's just easy money, man. It's, you can't get money like that on the stock market and stuff like that. It's just. Oh. And there's something about, and I think was the color of money. I think Paul Newman said it when he was talking to Tom Cruise. He said, money won is twice as sweet as money earned. And that's the fucking that's truth. 
It's true. It's the rush of the potential loss. It's the rush of knowing that you could lose it. And when you earn money, there's no risk of losing it. You're earning it. Yeah. It's always coming one way. But when you're gambling, it's like, you know, it's win. so when you win, you're like, hell yeah. It's like, I learned that in Vegas when I was sitting at that table playing blackjacks. And then I just started winning. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Now it's, and it gives you something to watch, too, because ordinarily, like, you know, I might not give a shit about Pittsburgh and Cleveland right. playing on a Monday right. night, but when my, that team's going to end my parlay for the week or something, you know, turn a hundred bucks into six fifty, I'm going to yeah. watch it. You know, yeah. I'm going to put yeah. eyes on, I got to see yeah, what's going on. Around. Go, 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 go <laughs> <laughs> over that, over that one field goal in the third quarter or whatever. You're like, Oh God, I've had some games, man, where there's just no way in hell people can't tell me that something wasn't fixed. Rigged. Yeah, yeah. and that happens. We've I've had guys on my show that they did. They literally point shade basketball games. The, yeah, the guy that done the, the Arizona State stuff. Yeah, well, the guys who make the point spreads are really really good, and it's all a numbers game. But you'd be surprised, man. You know, if you get some of the best handicappers like Larry, he he can almost tell you what the points are going to be in a game down to like within a point or two. So I mean, he's really good at it. Yeah, that that's a special kind of skill for sure. It right? is. And a lot of times they're right on or they're, they're within a point or two. And that's what, that's kind of the show I want to do is break down, you know, the general public maybe knows how to bet. All right. Well, I want to bet on this guy, I bet on this guy, but kind of how that works. Vegas wants basically everybody 50, 50 because they're going to collect the juice, which is yeah. the 10% from the loser. That's like so, any mob guy. They don't yeah. care. They just, that's the whole purpose. Like my grandfather was a layoff bookie, right? But he, he, he was he was like Larry. He actually looked my grandpa Toko looked like Larry, believe it or not. So they they so much about him remind my grandpa reminded me of Larry. But um the goal is just to balance the book and when then that kickoff or whatever game, it doesn't matter who wins because the yeah. loser pays the winners and you collect ten percent of the juice. And yeah. the, that's what a layoff bookie is. When you get freaking twenty-five bookies who are like total like five hundred grand off out of balance. Then you go to the layoff and say, can you handle 500 off the spread? And he says, no, but I got a guy in Vegas who does, and boom, boom, boom. So within an hour of the game, you balance it up, and then you can just – you don't even have to watch the game. Yeah. It doesn't matter who wins. And that's what I actually work with a guy. He's a he's a journeyman, and we needed some extra help. And my boss hired him to come down here. I'm the supervisor. And we got to talk, and he was like, I used to be a bookie. And I was like, oh, really? And he's like, yeah. He's like – he said, man, I was killing it one time. And he said – uh, it was the New England Patriots Super Bowl, the first one, when New England was undefeated. He said everybody took the Giants. The, for the one who was undefeated and they lost? Yeah, one that was lost. So he said everybody took the Giants, and he said, I just knew that they were going to kill him. He said, so I didn't lay any of it off. He said it wiped them out. And yeah. that's that's where a layoff bookie would come in because when everybody loads up on yeah. one side, you if you weren't equipped it. to handle that, you've got to lay some of that off to a bigger bookie. Yeah. Like you're talking about a layoff bookie. And he said he crippled him. He said he killed his business. He wound up having to sell his house and, and everything. Cause he was like, he was like, why would that not win? He's like, everything's set up for them to win. They got a perfect season, the best offense, you know, at that point, probably, you know, ever. And Eli Manning and the giants beat him. And the fluke. I know. And the, well, you tell him this, you were, you were set up to win, bro. All you had to do is freaking balance yeah. your book. Yeah. All you had to do is balance your book and you would have won. Yeah. Throw 50% of that one way. And then you're exactly. like, you said, you're collecting. Exactly. You find, find the other 50% go the other way and you just get your 10%. You would have won. Yeah. Um, but instead you got greedy. And so a lot of bookies get greedy and a lot of bookies learn the hard way in the mob um, from guys that are bad guys, like Tony Jackaloni type of guys. They're like, listen, you know, we're not going to cut you any slack if you're, if you're gambling. If you right. lose, you're paying. Yeah. The, if you lose, if you're a bookie and you're gambling and you lose, I'm going to go, here's the loan shark. He's going to give you the money to pay me. Now you're going to pay him big every week. Every week. And you're not going to miss. Now I own you for the rest of your freaking life. So <laughs> don't do not do that. You know. Yeah, you I tell to... people all the time, I was like, at least in my lifetime, you know, I've never met a broke bookie. No. No, yeah. not one that was not one that was doing it right. Yeah, the one that's doing it right. You know, those guys are the ones, like you said, driving the Harleys and driving the the, the nicer cars or whatever. You know, I've never met any. I've met a lot of broke gamblers. I have met a lot of them. <laughs> I knew some young uh, some young bookies too. When when I was you know young, I was in my twenties. I mean, I'm talking guys that were like 22, 23 years old. 
who were like, you know, they were putting it in, they were pulling, they like betting like 50 grand a week, you know, you know, booking 50 grand. And I'm like, that's pretty freaking good. You know, if they do it right, they're making five grand a week. I mean, that, that's pretty good for 22, 20. They learned it from like their uncle or their grandpa or something right. like that. And they had enough juice from that uncle and grandpa to where people wouldn't screw them. You know, I mean, somebody like me wouldn't just come up and go, oh, I'm, I'm betting five grand. When I win, I'll take the money. When I lose, I go, <laughs> sorry, guys. You know what I'm saying? Like, no, because if that if I did that, a guy like me would have came up and said, no, you can't do that. You know? Yeah. So they, they, you always have to have some some somebody about one of them was two of them were chaldeans believe it or not and i was kind of extorting them until they went to one of their chaldean like uh, mob guys and then they talked to the italian mob guys that i was with and they basically flipped it meaning <clears throat> the extortion stopped from me and started being them if yeah. that makes sense the, the chaldean guys started extorting their own they felt like if anyone's going to extort these kids it's going to be us not you <laughs> so it kind of screwed me over, but it was yeah. Weird. And I grew up around a lot of that too. My, my dad was a gambler. And so early on, I learned like, you know, what the spreads were, what the underdogs were. He used to tell me, he's like, Hey, if you pick me a winner on Monday, this is how crazy he was. He'd be like, you pick me a winner on Monday night, you know, I'll buy you your new video game or whatever. So as a kid, I would sit down and study. I'm You're like, handicapping. Oh, well, yeah. I'm handicapping as, you know, 10 years old. I'm a, it's like breaking internet days. I'm like, all right, well, the Minnesota's won the last three games. At prime time, you know, if they're home, they're home right now. I'm sorry, right, this one right here, and it wins. And then next thing you know, I got a new Nintendo 64 game or something sitting there. So would I was kind of broke would, into that early. Would he follow through on it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, he'd be like, all right, now, if you hit me two losers in a row, he's like, don't expect no no video games. You know, you got to win more than you lose to get get something out of this deal. So, yeah, he would follow through. So it's, I couldn't get a freaking nickel out of my dad, so <laughs> yeah, fuck you. <laughs> Well, man, I've had a blast. I've held you here about two hours, and we got your story, some of your story. You got a lot more to it, and we yeah, glossed cool. over it uh, for the better part. But, you know, we got that out of the way, so next time you come back on, man, we can just chop it up and, and talk about a lot of different stuff. Yeah, prison. There's a lot of stuff we didn't talk about. Yeah, yeah. Um, but for sure, we're going to put links to your book, To Be a King, on there. It's available hardcover, audio, or uh, paperback audio, all that good stuff. I've got it on audio myself. Um, you know, your rumble account, the Patreon with Larry Mazza. So if everybody wants to keep up with you, they can do that. And uh, I appreciate you coming on the show, my friend. I really do. Thanks for having me, man. Thanks for helping me kind of, uh, reinvent myself on rumble so I can share, share that and get myself out there and, um, and follow me too on my, uh, author page. I know my Facebook page is, um, author Gunnar Allen Lindblom. I've, I've neglected it for years, but I'm like, I'm going to start building it up because it does help me with uh, market. Cause I have my new book coming out. Mm -hmm. So my new book coming out, I want as many people at my author page as possible. I, think I got like 3000 people, but I should have right. been building, building it up for years. I'd be at 10, 20,000. Anyway. So thank you. Follow me there. Author going around my book, by the way, to be a King has its own page. It's got like 5,000 people uh, following it. So to be a King, the book pretty cool, but, um, and so check me out and, um, make sure to follow me on rumble. Absolutely. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I am Hollywood Wade. That was Gunnar Lindblom. And unfortunately, we are out of time. So tune in next week for an all-new episode of Crime and Entertainment. Gunnar, we appreciate it, my friend. God bless you, brother.